Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I warmly welcome you to the Emobile BW stream at the Hannover Fair Industry Digital 22, uh, uh, 2021. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Fischer. I'm the host uh, uh, for today and uh, for our program of tomorrow. Um, I'm head of the project and cluster activities at the state agency for new mobility solutions uh, and automotive Baden-Württemberg, short form Emobile BW. Um, our mission is to advance uh, the electrification and digitalization uh, of mobility in Baden-Württemberg and not alone, uh, together with a network of partners from industry and research and politics. Um, and our aim is to positively uh, shape the transformation um, of the automotive and mobility industry uh, here in the southwest of Germany. We would really be delighted uh, to see you all today in person at the Baden-Württemberg Pavilion at the Hannover Fair. Um, but uh, it is as it is. Uh, so um, our friends from Baden-Württemberg, uh, from other parts of Germany, from Europe and from all over the world cannot be uh, in person uh, here with us uh, today. Um, so uh, we thought about uh, what, uh, how we could uh, um, yeah, handle this situation. So we decided uh, we cannot completely replace all the interesting encounters, meetings and conversations um, uh, with the visitors uh, of our Baden-Württemberg Pavilion. Uh, but we have put together an interesting program uh, with presentations, with panel discussions, um, to give you a good impression of the current topics in the field uh, mobility of the future uh, in Baden-Württemberg. How you can participate, uh, I will tell you later on. Uh, and now, uh, yeah, the welcoming words uh, from the president of the Emobil BW, Franz Logan. Franz, I hand over the word to you. Wolfgang, thank you very much. A warm welcome also from my side uh, to all the spectators and the audience uh, worldwide and especially to our partners in Baden-Württemberg and in our partner regions. Digital Hannover Industry Fair 2021. This is the virtual e-mobile BW booth. My name is Franz Logan, as Wolfgang already said, I'm president of the e-mobile BW. What you can expect now is two and a half days of inspiring content. Thank you in advance to our speakers from Baden-Württemberg companies, Baden-Württemberg universities and research institutes, as well as to our partners from Ontario, Canada in the Wednesday session. The virtual fair, at least, is really different. There is no handshake to you, what is a pity, what is really a pity. There is no view into your open faces and no personal discussions. And there is no socializing. But we all will make the best of it. What is very important to keep our contacts alive because there is a time after the corona crisis and then we will meet personally again, we hope, on the booth of Immobile BW in 2022. What lasts is expertise, what lasts is excellency. After the corona crisis, we expect growing world markets. Positive tendencies are already to be seen, for example, actually in Asia, some in North America, some also in Europe. But after the crisis means within the changes, the changes what will come. We expect energy supply to become fossil free, including automotive drive lines. We expect streamlined supply chains with a steady supply of, for example, chips battery cells, and other high technology components. We also expect a struggle for seldom raw materials. Raw materials worldwide, and as you know, uh, not in every region you find the necessary raw materials. So exploring and delivering and logistics 
and the usage of raw materials is very, very important in future, and at least also the price position. And we expect an accelerating worth of data management systems, software, dedicated hardware, including operating systems or vehicle automation. What is the conclusions? In traditional markets, like combustion engines, competitors with a great price position will last. But this price position has to be worked out. It means, at least, automation. It means the best stuff worldwide. And then a competitor can last and can be one of the competitors with a fantastic price position in the market. Second part of the conclusion is, in the emerging technology markets, like e-mobility and vehicle data, lies a year-long chance to grow. Which ways does Immobile BW open? What do we, as Immobile BW, deliver to our partners in Baden-Württemberg and what we do deliver to partners in our partner regions worldwide. We support Baden-Württemberg companies and science institutes to pick the chances of the future. New process chains need networking with strong adaptive partners. We have the sophisticated networking platforms. You all know the clusters we manage, the cluster Electromobility Southwest, as well as the cluster Fuel Cell Baden-Württemberg. Become part of this excellency and try to use Hannover Industry Fair, even the virtual one, to come into discussion with our managers of the clusters. The change is knowledge-based. We also provide you with knowledge transfer via, for example, well-written science studies, individual talks, or collaborative discussion sessions. It is best to make the next step first and quickly. We initiate funded projects not funded projects. For example, investigating batteries, investigating battery manufacturing, manufacturing of electric automotive engines, recycling processes for batteries. But in the data systems, new operating systems for vehicles or fuel cell applications for example, for big vehicles like trucks, and, and, and. Working with excellent partners creates new knowledge, new products, new processes, and we have the platform for collaboration. Strengthening innovative, small and medium-sized enterprises. We have the tailored transformation support. We call it in Baden-Württemberg Transformationswissen BW, what seems to be only a German word for the transformation, but it means at least the operative and creative working together and support for small and medium-sized companies. What does it include? On the one hand side, it includes a hotline for our companies where they can ask and where they can discuss their special and personal situation. And then we offer a tailored knowledge data bank and tailored training for small and medium-sized companies changing their business from the traditional world into the new emerging markets. Company individual consultancy is also offered but it will be offered by partners, and those partners and consultancy is funded by the Baden-Württemberg Ministry of Economy. So coming at least to an end, 
What is the tasks 2021 in the mobility and in the energy business? The first task is fast scaling. Fast scaling of existing technology in electric vehicles, in charging systems, in electric networks, and much, much more. Fast scaling is a very good chance to make steps into a growing market, fast growing market worldwide, a really big billion euro, billion dollar market. The second task is to drive on the deep investigation and to find out the next big thing, like vehicle operating systems, fuel cell trucks, and mobility platform technologies, what we will see will take a major place in automotive and mobility business. It's your start of the day now, and it's your start to the next business, the next big thing. Virtual Hannover Industry Fair 2021 on the Immobile BW booth. We wish you good experience, good contacts, and at least a good business growing in emerging markets. We will be together for a good business development. With these last words and with the tasks 2021 in mind, fast scaling and deep investigation, I will pass on again to Dr. Wolfgang Fischer. He is director of Immobile BW. He leads us through the next inspiring hours and the next two days. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Franz. Uh, before I uh, uh, start uh, with our first session, um, just one short uh, last question uh, to you. You explained a lot uh, of the things, uh, uh, um, yeah, what, what the companies, uh, large companies, middle-sized companies, uh, small companies, what they can do uh, to, to push it, position them, themselves to yeah, positively shape this transformation process. Uh, yeah, always the question, put it in a nutshell, what, what's, uh, uh, what's the main point? Is it innovation? Is it knowledge? Um, is it qualification? Yeah, thank you for this great question, Wolfgang. Um, at least what we have to pick, it's a mixture of everything. In the next step of business, we will not be allowed to forget our old knowledge. There is a necessity that we know how to handle mechanical parts because there is still mechanical parts in cars, in vehicles, in trucks, in fuel cells, in battery components, whatever. So you need to have a press shop, you need to glue, uh, and whatever. But additionally, you need more knowledge on the electrical side and on the data side. So not forgetting the old things and having in mind all the new technologies. This is of big importance and this is one of the challenges for the companies in future as well as for the stuff. And if we discuss about the stuff, we see that future challenges for the individual person will at least grow. And to give them the chance to follow, it means at least that we have to qualify and we have, we means the companies and sometimes in schools and universities and whatever, it also means uh, uh, the state. We have to give people the chance to qualify so that they can step in into the new technologies and making them personally successful in future. So knowledge is the one thing, not forgetting the old one, picking up the new knowledge, and on the other hand side, we have to bring knowledge to persons, we have to bring knowledge to companies, and what is innovation? After having the knowledge, knowledge is a good thing, but you have to create based on this knowledge. You have to create new products, you have to create new processes, and then 
you have to go into market. And this at least means innovation, bringing ideas into market. Yeah, and of course scaling up. Uh, yeah, thank uh, you. Uh, or as uh, Elon Musk, uh, a few weeks ago, I saw him in an interview, he said uh, uh, innovation is 1% uh, inspiration and 99% aspiration. So, thank you very much, Franz. Uh, um, a very good start uh, for our uh, um, uh, Emobile BW stream uh, at the Hannover Fair. Um, yeah, uh, what uh, uh, are we planning to do in the next uh, um, uh, three days? Um, we put together a very interesting program. Before we go uh, very deep into the first session, um, uh, I just uh, try to give you uh, uh, yeah, an overview uh, what we have planned. We have, uh, I think, uh, five very interesting sessions planned. We will now start uh, uh, with uh, the software-defined vehicle. And in a session, always, we have some uh, representatives, some presenters uh, uh, from uh, uh, yeah, our excellent uh, research uh, institutes and universities in, in Baden-Württemberg and of course we have a lot of presenters from uh, the interesting companies in Baden-Württemberg so the first topic we picked is the, the software defined vehicle um, this will uh, be in uh, today's morning program uh, in the afternoon uh, we will uh, uh, switch uh, to our colleagues from uh, Baden-Württemberg International we are always doing uh, the Baden-Württemberg pavilion uh, in cooperation of Emobil BW and Baden-Württemberg International and uh, the region of Stuttgart, of course. Um, uh, and uh, in the uh, uh, Baden-Württemberg International stream, uh, which uh, is uh, parallel, uh, um, just uh, looking to some other topics, uh, of course, it's not only about mobility, uh, the industry from Baden-Württemberg, but um, uh, at uh, 1 o'clock uh, p.m. we will go to the welcome opening to the uh, BVE stream uh, by our Minister of Economic Affairs, Labor and Housing, Dr. Nicole hofmeister kaut and Dr. Christian Herzog, the CEO of Baden-Württemberg International. Um, and then in the afternoon we will have uh, some very interesting uh, presentations according new added value uh, through key components. Um, of course, all these new technologies, uh, they need uh, yeah, some different new components. Uh, and we have from the industry side and from the research side very interesting uh, insights um, in yeah, just uh, agile production systems. Um, uh, we uh, think about the, uh, the future powertrain, especially electric motors. Uh, it's about storage-based uh, high power charging, uh, of course, the whole uh, topic of, of uh, battery and energy storage technology. And uh, last but not least, of course, um, a lot uh, uh, of activities going around at the moment uh, around the field uh, of fuel cell te technology. So we will have a presentation of the high fat Baden-Württemberg uh, this afternoon. Um, tomorrow, uh, we have uh, two sessions as well um, in the morning. Um, we are just looking at the different developments uh, uh, around automated and connected driving. Uh, we will uh, just present some activities uh, in, in testing fields, in research projects in, in Baden-Württemberg, a very interesting vehicle concept for the future, um, uh, really some uh, living lab issues uh, um, uh, just uh, to uh, uh, using uh, uh, small shuttles uh, uh, in the public transport. Uh, I'm looking very forward to this and uh, in the afternoon tomorrow uh, we will look, of course we have uh, very uh, much established um, uh, companies in Baden-Württemberg in the different technologies but um, of course transformation is always about uh, yeah, coming up a lot of new uh, companies with new ideas, uh, new uh, technologies so we will have a yeah, next generation value creation we titled it so we will have a, a, a small startup pitch from companies from Baden-Württemberg um, uh, tomorrow afternoon and after that the discussion uh, with the founders uh, yeah, just thinking about how it is to, uh, yeah, to have a startup uh, in, in an ecosystem uh, like Baden-Württemberg. Everybody is talking always about the Silicon Valley um, uh, but uh, yeah there are a lot of interesting startups in Baden-Württemberg too so we will talk with them uh, tomorrow and as Franz already said uh, on Wednesday uh, we have a session um, uh, with our uh, new partner region uh, uh, of Ontario we uh, uh, a few weeks ago um, 
it's an it's a yeah a partnership uh, was going on for a lot of years, but we renewed it and put it on a new level. Uh, just signing an MOU a few weeks ago, uh, so we will have a, a session uh, autonomous and connected driving in Ontario in Canada. And for all our friends and partners uh, and members of the cluster electric mobility Southwest, of course, as you always know, on Wednesday in Hannover it's a, a happy hour day. So we will have uh, this year. Uh, a, a virtual cluster meeting in the afternoon on Wednesday and of course uh, uh, unfortunately only virtual but uh, yeah just uh, coming together uh, exchanging ideas um, so this is the whole program for the next three days uh, now we go a little bit deeper in uh, the uh, today's session the software defined vehicle um, this is our morning session um, so our uh, first presenter, I think, uh, uh, Eric Sachs, you can uh, um, already go to your place while I um, uh, say a few words. Uh, uh, I'm very happy uh, you are here. Um, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, and of course, uh, as it, you see the interaction on the screens, um, of course, uh, this is all according to the uh, actual um, uh, uh, valid uh, hygienic rules. Uh, of course, we all take care. We keep a distance uh, physically, but uh, it's, it's really good uh, to have you here um, and to discuss later on. Um, and now to hear your presentation, uh, let me say a few words about uh, Professor Dr. Eric Sachs. Uh, he's head of the Institute of Information Processing Technology at the Karlsruhe Institute uh, of Technology short KIT. Um, in addition, you are director uh, at the uh, Research Center for Informatik, Forschungszentrum Informatik, FZI, I think uh, internationally known, and of course at, this, uh, at the Hector School, this is the technology business school uh, of the KIT. Um, and you have been working very, very long, uh, a lot of uh, years. You have uh, at the moment currently, I think, yeah, 50 PhD employees, which is a very impressive number. Um, uh, and you're all working on process methods uh, and tools in systems engineering. Um, yeah, and of course, the, the, the whole idea of EE development, uh, um, yeah, you bring uh, not only your, uh, uh, your, uh, your university experiences, of course, you have a lot of years experiences in industry. Uh, uh, you worked for Daimler Buses, you worked for MB Tech Group. Uh, so, um, actually, we are really, really happy to have you here as an expert, and I'm looking forward uh, at first to your presentation and later on uh, to your discussion. Um, uh, before you start, a few words uh, to our viewers about the, the, the opportunities to participate. You all already logged in into our MIA platform. This is the event platform we are using today. So uh, the first step you already taken. Um, and uh, of course, uh, you see a, a chat uh, um, for Q&As uh, in, in this platform. So if you have any questions to the presenters, please uh, put them in this chat and we will take them later on in the podium discussion. Um, and uh, a second uh, opportunity to participate is our wall of ideas. If you happen to visit our booth two years ago in Hannover, we had this large wall which was empty at Monday on Monday, uh, and it's uh, yeah some sort of collaborative art project. So a lot of people could write something down, uh, some uh, people draw some very funny, interesting things on it. Uh, so we tried to put this in a virtual form. Uh, so uh, this is the wall of ideas um, uh, so you can put your ideas on and uh, I'm yeah very excited to see um, uh, what the result of this wall of ideas will be at the end uh, of uh, these three days um, and uh, yeah if you are not um, uh, uh, if you are not uh, able to follow the whole program uh, of the next three days of course uh, you can uh, see uh, the different presentations and discussions uh, afterwards in our YouTube stream, eMobile BW, you should see a link on the platform uh, to this. So now our presenter uh, is uh, supplied with uh, some water uh, and this uh, is from my side. Um, Eric Sachs, the word to you. I'm very happy you're here and I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much so far, Mr. Fischer. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the chance to be here virtually at the Nova Mess Fair. And um, yeah, one thing in advance, I hope you can see the slides. There I'm announced as the head of the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. This, of course, is a funny thing. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not really the head of the Karlsruhe Institute, the KIT. I'm head of the Institute for Information Processing Technology. And I recognize if I knew that the background is, is uh, uh, beige, it's gray as well, I, I would have heard other jacket. But anyway, I hope you can see me and I hope you can hear me. Yeah, what, I, what will I talk about? Um, the topic is architectures, software architectures in vehicles. And to, to understand what is currently going on, I think you have to go back to history. And I go back to history 20 years ago. When I started at Mercedes, I, I was once delivering to the rain sensor. The rain sensor is shown here. In the middle, you see an electronic control unit. On the left, you can see the mirror and the integration of the sensor behind the windscreen. On the right, you can see the Viper, and it's a closed loop. The Viper cleans the sensor, and it's a autonomous, it's an individual system. So what we have is a sensor, an ECU that realizes the function, and an actuator, the Viper, and the frequency and the Viper speed. <clears throat> and this, you had the chance to buy at a tier one delivery. Yeah, stepwise, year by year, this kind of integration crew and in the end, we have a kind of wild zoo of different ECUs. This is a signal-oriented approach. The CAN uh, was the protocol to put that into realization, to communicate from sensors to actuators. And um, so stepwise, one after the other, we integrated these ECUs from different suppliers that you all know, tier ones, tier twos, into the vehicle. And the integration task was more and more a challenge. So at a certain point, we recognized that it makes sense to have a cluster of domains. To cluster domains and say, OK, look here, it is a high speed challenge. We are in a powertrain area, for example or we are in a body uh, area where we have seats, heating, and not really real-time requirements. Furthermore, we had upcoming the idea of assistance systems, driver assistance systems. You can recognize that on the right top part. And stepwise, we recognize it gets more and more difficult not when we integrate a park assistant. But the moment we want to combine a lane keep assist with an automated uh, distance control to a highway pilot, we recognize, ah, does this still work on the signal-oriented level of integration? So I already pointed out that we had a growth of sensing a growth of capturing the environment. Ultrasonic was the first. I already mentioned the parking. But ultrasonic is slow and uh, it is cheap, of course. And stepwise, we integrated radar. Who thought that radar 10 years ago had such an overwhelming success in vehicles? LIDAR. We still say LIDAR is too expensive. We have the cameras to capture everything around. 360 degrees around, we talk about bird view or something like that. And now we come to a point where it's very difficult to integrate like the old fashioned way, to integrate one ECU after the other. Because it's, it's difficult to do it like that because we, we get a kind of Warthog. I looked up the term, Warthog is in term a Watzenschwein, more and more sensing, more and more antennas, and that does not work. So we double everything for each function. And therefore, we need something that covers on abstract level the environment. And therefore, we have a fused environment. We now say, OK, it's important to put all the information I can get 
from the traffic, from the other vehicles, from the environment, onto the vehicle and fuse this information with all the sensing. And then we need a system, a functions-oriented view to cover that all. And then the new chances of level four, level five, automated driving come in. In the end, we have to realize that on physical layers, on physical levels, and still currently mainly in domain controllers. And I pushed the wrong button. I apologize for the little delay. And in addition, we open the vehicle. And we say now we have the chance to communicate with a cloud, whatever cloud is, um, to communicate in a way we talk about car to X, vehicle to X, and X might be another vehicle, might be a back end, might be a roadside unit. And we think about a lot of these ideas of updates over the air. So sending information from a satellite, from a station, from a back end to the vehicle in order to fix bugs, to enhance the functionality, or to improve the functionality and optimize things that you might have honestly forgotten during the engineering phases. In addition, why don't you think about a situation where you say, hey, do I really need such a lot of ECUs in a vehicle? I'm not absolutely familiar with the number of ECUs in the new S-Class of Mercedes, but some say we nearly reached the 200 margin. So why don't we put functions in addition into the cloud? And there we can even have self-learning abilities. There we can have a control over the air of vehicles in an area that might not be too safety relevant. And of course we know that the moment we do that, we open uh, a gate. We open a gate that demands for new ways of security mechanisms. But the idea to save money that way, to save easy use in the vehicle, wiring in the vehicle, and, and, and have this fleet of vehicles that learn and improve functions in the back end, this idea is, is, is really, really a hot topic. So we differentiate between the logical and the physical architecture and level. And uh, next optimization step. When you talk to the premium OEMs, they currently talk about zones. They want to save wiring. They say really regional zones in a vehicle. And we do this as well and say, okay, uh, we have zones here that realize parts or complete functions. And recognizing that idea, you will soon come to a point where you say, signal orientation, where you really have to define, by the way, again, a number that is not proof, but I tell you that, 30,000 signals in the new s class. And if you want to manage this on a signal level and you want to be flexible for improving, for updates or functionality enhancements, it makes sense to put on this high level of integration of fusion a service-oriented approach. Services we know, client-server architectures, we know from the, your, your office building, your, your printer works like that, your common database works, works like that, and you are much more flexible the moment you do it like that. And this is what we call then a hybrid architecture. Why hybrid? Yeah, because the service orientation is not the only thing. Talking to your management in industry and say, hey, I, 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 I've heard a nice talk, and, and we realize now from, from scratch everything in service orientation. They say, are you mad? Because uh, you have proved quality. A window lifter is a window lifter is a window lifter. And, and this is still the signal oriented, the signal oriented uh, way how to develop. So hybrid, because you have to add, you have to mix now the service orientation and you have to mix the signal orientation because you want to save what you've done before. And this is a challenge. And of course, scream your work on that and, and uh, AutoSAR 
to mention one, is working on that, to save what you've done before, the way of thinking, the competencies you have in your engineering uh, departments, and to mix that. And this is then the next uh, hot topic. It's the carts, it's the components of the shelf that you want to reuse. And this was the effort of the last 10 years, reuse and do not invent the wheel twice. The moment you have this hybrid architecture, you can ask yourself, is that enough? How do you handle what I already mentioned? How do you handle the over-the-air communication? Is that signal-oriented? Is that another way? Is this what you know from uh, commercial um, gadgets like a handheld? How does it work in the end? So uh, you need even a universal architecture in the end. And uh, in addition, you have, you have the infrastructure. You have the parking areas, for example. They have already an infrastructure. You have to communicate with roadside units, and they are sending signals as well, like here in that example, a traffic light system. So what is the architecture of the future? It's neither white or black. It's a mixture. And an ideal way how you can put that is to say, OK, it's something where we have, in the end, a plug and play approach. Of course, I know that the realization of such a, such a visionary thought takes a long breath and needs a lot of efforts. But in the end, for the reasons I've mentioned, we need these universal architectures with different sections, with different parts. And the idea, again, is to put sliders on OK, sliders, again, are naive to a certain point. But this is how you have to realize that. Because you can't solve the problems of a premium level 5 vehicle with the solutions you have from, for a volume vehicle. You have to differentiate between a Golf and an A8 or something, to mention another um, brand as well. <clears throat> so and these sliders allow now to reuse a lot of the cards, to include a lot of infrastructure, maybe for vehicles of communality or of, of companies, and to have this over-the-air communication idea. And of course, and this is the important thing, and this is really a thing where we have to change thinking, is the service orientation, because otherwise we will not be able to handle the automated driving on that safety and security level. And this is my message, and this is my message for the uh, discussion in the podium afterwards. And uh, hopefully you use the online chance for further questions as announced by Wolfgang Fischer. And I'm, I'm keen on answering, or maybe I don't have an answer, then keen on discussing your questions with you. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Eric Sachs. Um, yeah, we have a little, a bit of time left. Uh, so, so just one, one short question before we, the, the, the rest we, we, we take in the, in the discussion. But um, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, you have a lot of uh, experience in the industry. You are now working uh, in the research area. So, so for the for the smaller companies, uh, as you you explained a lot of our universal architecture, of course. Uh, um, a lot of the companies in, in Baden-Württemberg, they are very much specialized on, on one or two components. What does it mean for them? Uh, what is the challenge for, for, for them according to the, to the, to the uh, universal architectures? Yeah, so on the one hand, honestly, really honestly, it's the, the staff you have. Mm -hmm. It's the qualification of the people. They are highly skilled, but now they have to move that, that skills to a new topic. They have to move that to the new challenges. And this, this is really this is a transformation. And this transformation um, takes place. And uh, Franz Logan pointed out that the state of Baden-Württemberg is very much uh, pushing towards that direction. And, and they, are, they are honestly, again, uh, the fast will eat the fat. 
Uh, the, the Fed must think about that and yeah. must change, otherwise they will shipwreck. Okay. <laughs> so for my, my opinion on that. <laughs> so this, this, is in a, uh, this is in a nutshell. So thank you very much for, for now. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I think we talk later in the discussion. Uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, points I think uh, we can discuss with the other two presenters. Uh, so I'm looking forward uh, to later, but for now, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, to our viewers, maybe uh, some of you uh, just joined uh, a few minutes later. Uh, uh, you are watching the Emobil BW stream uh, uh, for the Hannover Fair. Um, uh, in this year, 2021, of course, uh, unfortunately, we cannot be in Hannover in, in personally, so uh, we decided uh, to have a, a, a little streaming conference program uh, for you in the following uh, three days uh, to give you an impression about all the uh, topics uh, um, and all the uh, activities going on in, in, in Baden-Württemberg. Um, and of course, as I said at the beginning, uh, you're locked already in in our event platform, the MEA platform. You have uh, different possibilities to participate. Um, uh, of course, if you have some questions uh, uh, to the presentations, uh, just use the chat. There you see a, a small chat for, for Q&A. We put all your questions, uh, um, if we have time, uh, with the uh, presenters uh, directly. But most of the questions we will just uh, put in that uh, panel, discussion, uh, pa panel discussion with all uh, the three presenters uh, uh, later on. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, one last uh, uh, remark to our wall of ideas. Uh, as I said before, um, yeah, uh, two years ago in Hannover uh, on our booth, uh, if you happened to visit us there, we had a, a large wall, an empty wall at the beginning of the week. Uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, we used five days uh, uh, for all the people visiting our booth uh, to uh, write something on the wall. Um, I just say hello. <laughs> uh, uh, to write something uh, uh, on the wall, to do some drawings and everything. Uh, so uh, we had, uh, have now a virtual wall of ideas. Uh, please uh, give us your ideas about the mobility of the future. So we have uh, yeah, some sort of collaborative uh, artwork uh, and result at the end uh, of the three days. Um, I'm looking forward to that. And of course, if you are uh, not able to follow all the presentations and discussions in the next three days uh, live, uh, you can uh, look them afterwards in the YouTube stream of Emobil BW. You find a link uh, here in the program. So this brings me just first to say hello uh, to our next uh, uh, presenter, um, uh, to uh, Erdin Shilkaya, uh, almost. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry for the pronunciation. I, uh, <laughs> Um, uh, so I'm very happy that you're here, uh, that you join us uh, for, for today. Uh, you are authorized manager of new mobility ecosystem and exceptional tasks from the Bertrand Group. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, you had uh, an exchange of ideas uh, a few weeks ago uh, with my colleague Valeria Meyer, and she was very enthusiastic uh, afterwards and said, ah, we have to invite him uh, uh, for our Hannover stream. Uh, so I'm happy uh, to get to know you and uh, uh, to uh, uh, listen to your presentation uh, uh, today. Uh, yeah, a few words uh, uh, to our viewers. Um, uh, to your person, uh, you have uh, a large, uh, uh, yeah, almost uh, yeah, 19 or almost 20 years automotive research and development experience, uh, over 219 different projects. Uh, you worked for more than six global player companies uh, in the OEM sector, tier one sector. So you bring a lot of uh, experiences uh, uh, with you. Um, uh, so, uh, at the moment, you are very much focusing on, yeah, uh, yeah, special tasks, municipalities, existing small uh, and big companies, startups. Um, uh, yeah, you support them as a, a lecturer, as a mentor, as a coach. Uh, you are a jury member in, in, in some ways. And um, yeah, um, of course, uh, yeah, you have a broad experience. You have a broad field uh, of work. So we are really 
happy to have you here. Uh, at first to listen to your presentation uh, and then afterwards uh, we take all the questions from the viewers in the discussion. So uh, the floor is yours. I'm uh, uh, happy to hear your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to my uh, part uh, with, uh, I will say, maybe uh, a short overview. I will, I will give you a short overview about um, the Shaper Enabler Provider Principle. And uh, don't lose time. Let's start. What I, what I like to tell you is uh, uh, what we are recognizing the last few years, not months, years, and the duration of fast changing world. We, were, we, we stormed about this, what happens in the world. Then we come into forming the situation about the last and what is in the next. And uh, then we said, how could we perform with our USPs we have in Baden-Württemberg and also in our company? And the last thing is um, we like to expand um, in the world's market to be honor of Baden-Württemberg's company and, and uh, take that to design the future together uh, with Baden-Württemberg of mobility. First of all, I will say, what, what did we recognize? Um, we recognize that we have a changing culture, for example. The new generation X, Epsilon Z, however you call them and analyze them, in general, no one or not everyone more likes to have one car. They like to have mobility. And therefore, these hashtag mobility is uh, really um, common and every day's word we use or also in our company and, and, and our doing today. And this lends me or uh, brings me to the situation to have these exceptional tasks to analyze the market for the future and what could we do with them. I think the main thing here is everyone likes to be mobile, but don't earn or buy a car. And they like to spend $250 per month for that. And they like on demand and they like uh, entertainment and they like music streaming and so on. The second thing what we analyzed is that mobility as a service is a uh, high potential market for the future. And there are some uh, different statistics uh, from uh, uh, common good analysis companies. And the second thing is autonomous driving and the connectivity be between both. Then we recognize that there is a technological improvement. Um, that means with that technological improvement, you have no new use cases. With that use cases, you have the possibility, ability, if you do it right, uh, to design your future of your company. Nevertheless, it's a startup, or it's a small, medium enterprise, or it's a big company like we have a lot of in Baden-Württemberg. So different use cases based on new technologies. We recognized Again, by a different statistic that there are three main topics we have, uh, I already told you. And the third topic, the uh, technology, we, um, we adapted enabling technology in front of them. And the enabling technologies are products who are now common in our all day um, present. And if you recognized all these things, then you have to storm. You have to storm. What could we do with that potential? And after our storming, we had a huge ecosystem, um, business ecosystem, or use case ecosystem founded. And every company in the world, or in Baden-Württemberg, or in your region, has maybe a role inside these topics, inside these network. So what we say, the new thing is that they are related together, that they're connected together. And therefore, I use especially the uh, word of ecosystem. That means if you do your job well, 
but the other one not. He couldn't use your well done jobs. So that means you have to interact and work together. That is what we, um, as a result, as, uh, uh, after our storming. In the third part, by forming, we said, what must we do to secure our future of our company and employees? And also, what for benefits we could do for our customers, also for our clients? First of all, uh, you start with the organization. We looked into Bertrand in that case and say, we are a decentral company in 50 locations over the world and everybody or every location maybe does the same thing. So the first thing is to switch the organization from decentral company to a competence company, focus company by centralization. That means the first thing is organizational thing. And this we put into a so-called project matrix organization or unit organization. The second thing about the storm, uh, about the forming is, uh, where do we see especially oriented on our USPs and on our competences and on our know-how inside the company and next to us, our clients and su suppliers um, and customers? That means we made a uh, business analysis first at Bertrand, like SWOT technologies, you know that, uh, where we have the more uh, opportunities for the future in which area uh, we should focus on. And the result of that forming is that we matched our classic portfolio to the new portfolio, what is needed, and prioritize that, that. And not end with that, also we said which unit is in which area focused on. So we like to increase our efficiency and effectivity by doing our work with more than 12,000 engineers around the world focused on the target and on the goals of the market of the future. Then, next forming step was, what is our, what is our role? What is, what is the new role um, situation? And we say we have a shaper, that is the customer, client, maybe one OM or tier one. But nowadays, it could be also a government, uh, SMA, or a startup also. The second thing is uh, you have provider. That means they have some products or something like that or services already. But what is missing? Missing is one leading a neutral company maybe with the experience and know-how to put them together to a new business role or model for the future. And that we call, this is the enabler role, and that is that what we have uh, on our headlight. At the, at the end, you have to detail that which role brings what with which process and what is the result of them uh, at the end. The shaper, also called the client, he brings the use cases, he, he brings the needs. The provider brings products, hardware, software, services, after sales, workshops, and so on. And the new role of Bertrand, maybe as a development partner, and not just an engineering company, is maybe the bridge between both to put that uh, services and needs together with focus on high tech by digitalization, by autonomous driving, by connectivity, by electricity, and also hydrogen. And not but not least, digitalization, of course. If you have a huge world of um, ecosystem partners, or your company is huge, then you have to put, it, put that uh, in some clusters, I call. And that is the microeconomic situation of yours. In that case, I have here an example. This is also individual about your topics, of course. 
but with that you have a one picture about your ecosystem and that is needed if you do some complex and high-end and new feature-based technology projects. Because I'm really, I, I think no one could do high-tech development for the future by his own. The next thing to perform is uh, where are, is our USP? to focus on that more, to have more efficiency. And uh, maybe Bertrand is known as a company for uh, automotive development, uh, especially. And uh, in that case, uh, we moved around this mobility situation. Uh, our portfolio focused more on the portfolio and detailed it. Then also with that now how we have, we say we make a suggestion about the common platform in context of uh, software driven architecture, for example, or safety architectures or safety future of autonomous driving or mobility concepts in general. So with our know how we had um, uh, categorized the architecture in the car and outside of the car. Um, with uh, some specific topics where we are expert in. Then we also thought about the performing, what could our new services uh, in digital context with the new technologies. And there are uh, huge types of uh, products or services or development things, prototypings that may be actually existing, but not, not existing in that case or uh, not as existing, so you have to develop that maybe for, before you make a research by using universities uh, from your region, and so you get connected with them, and also you could put them as a maybe new employers to your projects after doing some master thesis, bachelor's, or uh, project work. The last thing is, if you make all these homework, I will say, in our case, it took more than three years now, then you could also uh, look into your future and say, okay, I did my homework in a region or regional or in Germany. How could I expand my portfolio, my network? And uh, so that means maybe you also look to startups or spin-off or uh, spin-offs or SMEs in your region and put them into your projects and um, help them to grow, for example. And uh, there in this slide, you see a lot of ecosystems by companies or technological uh, uh, topics. And um, there is no end about your own uh, ecosystem, but I'm sure you have to use uh, companies in front of you, behind you, and next to you, maybe also your competitors, uh, to be able to solve the future's needs. At the end, you have your own macroeconomics. That means your uh, public relation to the upper side, to outside, which is, uh, but it depends on political things, what happens, actually COVID topics, we have uh, globality, locality, uh, new generation, uh, crisis there, um, economical crisis, of course. Then you have your traditional work where you be successful the last years. Then you have a market which defines your prices or acceptance of your products and services. And then you now have maybe a new business model for you regarding your classic topics and the new topics. And maybe also a new role defined by you. And therefore, at the end, I will ask you, what is your next step for transformation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, very interesting, uh, especially uh, uh, I call it the ecosystem approach, uh, which is, of course, uh, yeah, Immobile DBW understands itself as a network agency. So uh, uh, I think we, we agree in, 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 in this point. So um, 
Yeah, I think we are uh, almost out of time. We have a lot of things to discuss later on. So for, for this mom uh, moment, thank you very much, uh, Edin Yashilkaya. Uh, we see each other again in a few minutes. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, our next presenter is uh, already here. Um, Before I say hello to him, uh, a last, uh, uh, of, of course, I uh, would like to uh, recall uh, the, uh, yeah, the uh, different uh, possibilities to participate uh, for our viewers. Use uh, the chat uh, function, uh, um, yeah, to put some questions to the presentations. We all put them later on in uh, the in our uh, panel discussion. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, if you has, have some further ideas about uh, the mobility of the future, uh, drawings, uh, general ideas, some uh, words, uh, uh, just feel free to put them on our wall of ideas. Okay, uh, so now our next presenter, uh, Dr. Christian Schier from AVL uh, Germany. Um, uh, uh, I'm happy you're here. Uh, we know each other, I think, five or six years uh, uh, now. Uh, you are principal engineer at the Advanced Solution Lab of AVL Germany uh, in, in Karlsruhe. Uh, you, yeah, your main interests are new development methods and tools for highly automated and electrified mobility systems in the automotive, agricultural and maritime domain. Uh, we, I, I remember uh, we talked a lot about chips uh, uh, the other day. Um, yeah, you authored over 100 scientific uh, publications. Uh, you have eight patents. Uh, your PhD is uh, uh, from uh, the KIT. Uh, you also uh, have a degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Texas uh, at Austin. Uh, and uh, last but not least, a diploma in mechanical engineering from the Vienna University of Technology in Austria. So we are really happy to have you here. We are looking forward to your presentation and uh, the discussion afterwards. So uh, I uh, give the word to Dr. Christian Schier. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fischer. Uh, hello and welcome to my talk. Uh, I have the honor to present you a new project. It's a, a project with organizations, research organizations and companies uh, strongly supported by E-Mobil Baden-Württemberg. Thank you very much. The project called KISME. So KISME is essentially the German name of the project and the, as you can see in the announcement, um, I hope in the next uh, minutes I can give you a more deeper understanding what this project is about. So the project started begin of this year. Um, it's planned to last for three years. Um, and the funding, um, to be mentioned is done by the um, uh, German state, um, by the Ministry um, for Economy, and it's in the funding project, funding program New Vehicle and System Technologies. So, to introduce the project, what is the main motivation for Project KISS May? Um, first of all, automation is a hot topic, uh, not only in automotive industry, but also in different related industries, like, like shipping mentioned by Dr. Fischer, but also aerospace engineering, um, consider the upcoming um, drone industry, also now um, a hot topic in Germany. So, um, when we look at such a scenario, especially in, in dense urban areas, automated vehicle must make reliable decisions under any uh, conditions in real time. So real time means, um, if we detect a critical scenario, and I will come back to that later, um, it must be detected reliable in a given short time period. So uh, what's the big challenge now? Um, as you can imagine, such scenarios um, in urban areas, they have a lot of traffic participants. Not only that, all of them are related somehow to infrastructure. So to capture that and to get a good understanding for the software decisions to be made for a safe and um, reliable driving of different vehicles in such environments, a wide range of sensor sets has to be used to capture the surrounding um, uh, environment. So we have to scope with a fairly huge amount of data coming in from all the different sensors, like camera sensors, like radar sensors, like LiDAR sensors. 
this is an example um, what I mean with critically relevant scenarios. So first of all, a critical scenario is really where it's getting dangerous. So you know from your driving in everyday situation, suddenly someone steps in front of your vehicle, yeah, wants to cross the road unexpected, you have to take a fast and strong decision to avoid any accidents. Relevant scenarios are some things which are not immediately lead to an accident, but they're critical in such a, such a sense that it might be that some sensor data getting degraded, we call it. That means the sensor does not uh, provide the full reliability we see, for example, under uh, favorable weather condition. Like when we look outside now, we had even snow now in April here in southern part of Germany. So um, we have to have a really reliable understanding of the environment um, of our sensor set. Another issue comes with that is different traffic configurations, not only in urban areas like construction sites, but also in rural areas, like when we have automated vehicles on the road, for example, to transfer from a farming location to a farmyard, and then suddenly they are confronted with um, people driving fairly fast on electric bikes on narrow roads. Or when we have situations where we're driving on hilly and curvy roads so that our environmental perception, we call it, has to be excellent under all these conditions so that we are capable in the future to provide reliable automated systems. This is an example and uh, also the current uh, challenge in not only in our group, in the consortium of the KISME project, but also in the overall industry, um, working hard uh, to increase the reliability and robustness of autonomous systems. So this is one of uh, our test vehicles in the project, which has a fairly, I would say, moderate um, um, sensor set. It has six cameras to get a 360 degree view around the vehicle. We have three LiDAR systems, which is not too many. Yeah? We have one precise location and we have abundant uh, conventional vehicle systems like wheel speed, steering angle and so on. And just as an example with this vehicle, as, to, as soon as we start and start recording, we generate around 360 megabytes of raw data every second. So when you calculate it up and say, well, I'm driving one shift, with one set of driver, yeah, then we're generating 10,000 gigabytes in one shift. That's a really huge amount of data. No? And every gigabyte, every terabyte, every pentabyte, we keep on later on for later processing getting more and more expensive. Yeah? And so the current challenge is how can we reduce this kind of big amount of data to this amount of data which is really useful and valuable to be processed and stored for later analysis. So coming back to our project consortium, we have a fairly um, uh, balanced um, uh, aggregation of research organizations like KRT, like Fraunhofer EMI in Freiburg here in Baden-Württemberg, like Research Center Informatics in Karlsruhe, working tightly together with industry. We have a uh, large industry with Bosch Research, we have a technology provider, EVL, where I'm working for, and we have two uh, small and medium enterprises, Lingdao, uh, MindMotive, and not to forget, actually, the three ones, also ERA Consulting. One unique um, um, configuration in our consortium is a very strong support of so-called associated partners, which are ASAM, I will come back later for standardization, and eMobile Baden-Württemberg as our cluster. So, um, what are the project goals? We have two main goals. One is on board, I will explain in a minute. It means what happens on the vehicle. And this is essentially focused around the question, what shall we record, what shall we store yeah, for later analysis? And the related question to answer, what can we do off board? That means in the office, having the data in the cloud to analyze data and improve our uh, intelligent algorithms to be implemented on board. So this is the key challenge, not only for the onboard system, but to have a parallel process, a parallel structure um, to improve continuously um, the detection of critical and relevant scenarios. 
I will give you now um, a practical overview of one of our uh, planned vehicles. You see here, this is the onboard unit. That means we have on the lower side the incoming data from control units, conventional speed sensors, acceleration sensors, but also the wide range of data coming in from environmental sensors. As I mentioned, camera, LiDAR, radar. So all of this has to be processed, adapted, brought into efficient data formats until it's passed over on board to our new components, to our uh, AI-based components. And they are, have essential, essentially three main functions, which are the object detections. So which objects are around the vehicle. We have the understanding, what are these objects doing and what uh, the planning to be, so that we can derive so-called scenarios. And within the scenarios, we can derive so-called maneuvers, so that we know what are the different activities of the, of the traffic uh, participants uh, in this situation, so that we can have a sound decision, is this a critical, a relevant scenario or not, and take the appropriate automated measures uh, to process this data or not. One big issue, um, not in our project, but also in the overall industries, we have to work together. We've seen different companies between OEMs, between Taiwan, between technology providers, between tool suppliers. And the key to success here is standardization, not only in Germany, but all around the globe. And Germany is very active, especially in the ESAM uh, group, which is a non-profit organization working hardly to improve existing standards. These are the so-called OpenX family for automated and autonomous driving, but also continuously coming up with new standards which support the development and the production of highly automated vehicles. In our project KISME, we not only want to work on algorithms, on functions, we also want to prove that that can work. So it's not a fairly scientific-oriented project. It also has a strong practical focus, where we have four different groups of demonstrator vehicles, um, not only on the road yet, but also continuously improved with the upcoming um, um, extensions um, and add-ons for our AI-based algorithms. This is a classic passenger car you can see provided by Research Center Informatic. This is a so-called people mover, a small bus, uh, an unmanned bus, no driver, just a safety driver currently, in the future hopefully non-safety driver necessary, uh, provided by Bosch Research. We have a, a commercial transporter provided uh, by Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and we have a commercial utility vehicle unmanned provided by AVL where we want to implement, demonstrate and evaluate our project results. So I'm coming now to the summary and outlook. Um, I showed you the basic challenge for collecting and handling large amount of data for highly automatis, automa, autonomous vehicles and the focus of our project KISME to come up with new uh, AI-based algorithms and functions within an efficient architecture utilizing existing and upcoming standards to support an efficient development of such vehicle concepts but also to bring uh, a significant contribution to the successful introduction into daily lives. Thank you very much and I'm glad to answer any questions. So, thank you very much for the presentation uh, to uh, Christian Scheer. Um, actually, as we have uh, 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 a few minutes left, um, one question uh, which comes to my mind, uh, I think uh, the, the, the KISME project is a very interesting uh, approach. Uh, we're always discussing about, uh, uh, yeah, in artificial intelligence that we are, um, yeah, somewhere there's a, a large distance uh, between Europe and, uh, and China and, and North America and a lot of people are, are talking about a uh, yeah, certain European way in, in artificial intelligence. What's, what's your opinion or, or what's the, uh, the, the point of the project uh, on, on, on this uh, uh, way?
Well, uh, I always say there's a big difference between the different systems. No? Uh, when you look in, 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 in Europe, we have, we have a system where we want to do as much as possible before we go on the road, before we bring uh, vehicle systems on the road. So we have to do a lot of effort to secure, to have a really high level of security, of safety. When you look at other countries, like uh, in North America, it's m much more easier to bring systems on the road, but mm -hmm. If something happens, you have to take. You, you, but we are accountable for that. Okay. Yeah. So that means um, you have to make insurances and so on and so forth. And this, I think, uh, is system immanent. So in one system, it's easier to get on the road. But if something happens, you really have to pay a lot of money. In Europe, we have to make a lot of effort upfront. Yeah. So that hopefully nothing happens. There's one issue I didn't explicitly mention, which is privacy. If we have cameras on board, okay. we are obliged to 100% fulfill the actual legislation, which also is one, uh, one strong uh, focus in the, in the project, to have more efficient algorithms that we do not even take critical data off the vehicle. So we do not even store them on the vehicle. So data privacy to scope with it with significant cameras is expensive and we want to take that into account and this is also one benefit uh, to research in the area of more efficient algorithms to process the data already on board, be it for research purpose, but also later on when vehicles go into production that we have a kind of uh, event record and so on, also using these algorithms. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we, we can uh, go a little bit deeper uh, in the uh, panel discussion afterwards. So for the moment, uh, thank you very much uh, to Christian Schier uh, from ABL Germany. Um, and uh, yeah, now, uh, uh, yeah, just it's time for a short uh, movie. Uh, uh, it's a short film by the Strategic Dialogue for the Automotive Sector in, in Baden-Württemberg. It's a, a dialogue process between industry uh, and politics uh, and uh, yeah, different actors from research and society as well, uh, which uh, has been started in 2017. Uh, last year we had uh, uh, yeah, a large halftime conference and uh, for this, uh, this uh, film uh, has been made um, and the title is How is Digitalization Changing Traffic in Baden-Württemberg? So we're now uh, watching this uh, short film and afterwards we will have the panel discussion with our presenters uh, uh, from uh, the last uh, hour. So, uh, as uh, one famous German showmaster said, uh, Mats up. <laughs> Wann immer es um die Mobilität der Zukunft geht, fällt irgendwann ein Schlagwort, Digitalisierung. Dieser Begriff umfasst nicht nur das Umwandeln analoger Prozesse in digitale, im Verkehr steht er für eine ganze Reihe von Innovationen. Etwa vernetzte Fahrzeuge, die miteinander und der Umwelt kommunizieren, oder intelligente Apps, die allerlei Daten ganz unterschiedlicher Verkehrsträger zusammenbringen und dadurch neue Geschäftsmodelle ermöglichen. Über allem schwebt die Vision des automatisierten Fahrens, gesteuert nicht mehr von Menschen, sondern von Computern. Nun, welche Beispiele für eine gelungene Digitalisierung im Verkehr lassen sich in Baden-Württemberg bereits entdecken? Wir haben uns auf die Suche gemacht in der digitalen und der analogen Welt. Fündig geworden sind wir in Hockenheim, im Nordwesten des Landes, 20 Kilometer südlich von Mannheim. Bekannt geworden ist die Stadt auch durch die Motorsportrennstrecke Hockenheimring. Dort geht es meist analog mit Vollgas zur Sache. Doch in der Stadtverwaltung ist man einen großen Schritt weiter, wie uns der Bürgermeister Markus Zeidler verraten hat. Denn dort erfassen rollende Kameras den Zustand der Straßen. Das Projekt in Como 4.0 wurde im Strategiedialog Automobilwirtschaft aufgelegt. Ja, erstmal die Stadt Hockenheim freut sich natürlich, dass sie bei dem Förderprogramm zum Zuge gekommen ist in Zusammenarbeit mit der Firma Vialytics. In Como ist für uns eine tolle Chance, interkommunal zusammenzuarbeiten und gerade, denke ich mal, bei Straßensanierungen ist es eine ganz tolle Sache, wenn man A mit Vialytics einen Partner an der Hand hat, der A diese Straßenerkennung und diese Straßenzustände erfasst. Und wenn man dann noch äh, sagen wir mal, interkommunal zusammenarbeiten kann, 
bringt es natürlich auch Synergieeffekte. Gerade wenn man Straßen sanieren will, macht Ausschreibungen, man hat Baustelleneinrichtungen. Und da ist es natürlich eine tolle Sache, wenn man ja interkommunal zusammenarbeiten kann. Und somit nutzen wir genau dieses Incomo-Projekt, die Zusammenarbeit mit Vialytics zu verstärken, um den Zustand unserer Straßen zu erfassen. Und dann aber auch den entscheidenden Gremium natürlich auch eine Entscheidungserleichterung an die Hand zu geben, weil bekanntlich der Algorithmus, der ausrechnet, wie der Zustand der Straßen ist, der lügt nicht. Und nachdem wird eine Prioritätenliste erstellt. Und somit können wir gezielt investieren. Wir können aber auch gezielt planen, gerade was die nachhaltige Planung in den Finanzhaushalten angeht. Der Prozess ist ganz einfach. Ein Smartphone wird an eine Scheibe eines Baufahrzeuges äh, geklemmt. Dieses Smartphone macht alle zwei bis drei Meter ein Foto von der Straße. Dies wird in ein WebGIS-System aufgenommen und dadurch werden die Straßen ausgewertet und der Straßenzustand wird festgestellt. Und die Digitalisierung erleichtert uns natürlich, eine, somit eine Prioritätenliste zu erstellen. Somit wissen wir, welche Straßen a. dringend zu sanieren sind und b. welche auch in naher Zukunft kommen und somit uns eine solide und nachhaltige Finanzplanung ermöglichen. Im halbjährlichen Turnus sammeln städtische Fahrzeuge die Bilddaten von der Straßenoberfläche praktisch ganz nebenbei. Künstliche Intelligenz untersucht die Bilder auf Straßenschäden und macht Vorschläge zur Sanierung. Dem incomo projekt in Hockenheim haben sich 18 weitere Kommunen angeschlossen, um von Netzwerkeffekten zu profitieren. Hockenheim tickt sehr digital. Wir sind dabei, alles aufzuarbeiten. Die Corona-Krise hat natürlich auch dazu beigetragen, dass gewisse Entscheidungen in politischen Gremien, gerade was die Digitalisierung angeht, leichter geworden ist. Wir stellen um auf Homeoffice-Plätze. Wir wollen weiterhin mit jungen Startups zusammenarbeiten, die das Thema Digitalisierung groß auf die Fahne geschrieben haben. Und ähm, wir freuen uns natürlich über jeden, der sich an uns wendet und eine Idee hätte, wie man digital ja, die Stadt Hockenheim weiter voranbringen kann. Dieser Strategie-Dialog ist eine ganz tolle Sache. Wir unterhalten uns über die Themen Digitalisierung, wir unterhalten uns über die Themen Startups und wir unterhalten uns, wie wird die Automobilindustrie in Zukunft denn in Deutschland aussehen, aber auch in Baden-Württemberg. Baden-Württemberg, das Autofahrerland, Hockenheim, die Rennstadt Nummer eins in Deutschland, sind natürlich gerade, was die Entwicklung des Automobils angeht, hoch interessiert und deswegen freut es uns, dass wir uns mit ja, solchen jungen Startup-Unternehmen wie Vialytics zusammenschließen und gerade in dem Bereich einiges ausprobieren. Profitieren kann davon jeder und bekanntlich der der Fortschritt soll auch in den Städten und Gemeinden nicht zu kurz kommen. Für Bürgerinnen und Bürger hat die Digitalisierung in diesem Fall ganz praktische Vorteile. Bessere Straßen, für deren Erhalt und Sanierung weniger Steuergeld aufgewendet werden muss. Das Projekt läuft über drei Jahre, dann werden die erwünschten Einspareffekte evaluiert und der hoffentlich positive Effekt auf den Straßenzustand kann ebenfalls nachvollzogen werden. Ortswechsel Rund 50 Kilometer südlich von Hockenheim liegt die Fächerstadt Karlsruhe. Von der zweitgrößten Metropole des Landes aus wird das Testfeld autonomes Fahren Baden-Württemberg gesteuert. Dabei handelt es sich um ein Reallabor für Mobilitätskonzepte. Seit Mai 2018 wurden verschiedenste Straßen, aber auch Wohngebiete und Parkhäuser technisch so ausgerüstet, dass vernetzte und automatisierte Fahrzeuge darauf erprobt werden können, und zwar im Alltagsverkehr. Details zum Testfeld hat uns Katja Gickelhorn verraten. Sie arbeitet bei der E-Mobil BW GmbH, einer Innovationsagentur des Landes, die als zentrale Anlaufstelle für alle Belange rund um neue Mobilitätslösungen fungiert. Das Land Baden-Württemberg beschäftigt sich schon sehr lange mit äh, Technologien rund um Digitalisierung und auch ähm, ja, Innovationen. Ähm, und automatisiertes und vernetztes Fahren ist natürlich dann ein sehr, sehr wichtiger Baustein. Bereits seit 2014 arbeiten wir an diesen Themen im Cluster Elektromobilität in der Arbeitsgruppe Intelligent Move. Und im Rahmen dieser Arbeitsgruppe ist es auch gelungen, diverse Fördervorhaben ähm, auf den Weg zu bringen und eben auch ein Konzept für dieses Testfeld zu entwickeln. Und die Landesregierung hat dann eine Ausschreibung für dieses Testfeld in Gang gebracht und 2018 wurde das Testfeld eröffnet. Und dieses Testfeld befindet sich zwischen Karlsruhe, Bruchsal und Heilbronn. Und das Besondere dabei ist, dass eben alle verschiedenen Straßenarten, die es so gibt, sei es städtischer Verkehr, sei es Landstraße oder eben auch die Autobahn, in diesem Testfeld verankert sind. Und ähm, kleine Unternehmen, große Unternehmen und auch Forschungseinrichtungen haben die Möglichkeit, auf diesen Teststrecken ihre Dienstleistungen und Produkte zu testen. Erprobt werden im Testfeld auch völlig neuartige Fahrzeuge. Entwickelt werden sie beispielsweise in dem vom Bundesministerium für Verkehr und digitale Infrastruktur geförderten Forschungsprojekt EVA Shuttle. 
Das steht für elektrische, vernetzte und autonom fahrende Elektro-Minibusse im ÖPNV. Die Fahrzeuge werden in Karlsruhe unter realen Bedingungen, jedoch stets mit Sicherheitsfahrer und zunächst ohne Passagiere getestet. Das hinter dem Testfeld Autonomes Fahren Baden-Württemberg stehende Konsortium hat parallel bereits damit begonnen, den Karlsruher Stadtteil Weierfeld-Dammerstock auf den Einsatz der Minibusse vorzubereiten. Die Shuttle sollen zum Beispiel direkt mit Ampeln kommunizieren. Wenn alles klappt, können Fahrzeuge die Shuttles irgendwann per App rufen. Die autonomen Minibusse nehmen ihre Passagiere dann nach dem Prinzip von Fahrgemeinschaften auf und bringen sie an ihre Ziele. Das Projektkonsortium aus FZI-Forschungszentrum Informatik, Bosch, TÜV Süd, VBK und IOKI erprobt damit ein neues Angebot im öffentlichen Personennahverkehr, das den Menschen künftig noch mehr Möglichkeiten und Komfort bieten will. Vernetzung und Automatisierung – das sind die ganz großen Aufgaben, die bei der Digitalisierung der Mobilität zu meistern sind. Die Unternehmen in Baden-Württemberg müssen für diesen Wandel viele neue Kompetenzen erlernen und Erfahrungen sammeln. Auch dabei hilft ihnen die E-Mobil BW und zwar mit der neuen Landeslotsenstelle Transformationswissen BW. Ja, die Digitalisierung hat das Potenzial, ein wahrer Gamechanger zu werden. Das heißt, dass Automatisierung und Vernetzung die Mobilität, wie wir sie heute kennen, grundlegend verändern werden. Und das ist nicht nur auf der Seite der Geschäftsmodelle der Fall, sondern eben auch bei der Produktion. Auch diese wird sich grundlegend verändern. Auch wie Fahrzeuge in Zukunft verkauft werden zum Beispiel oder auch, wenn ein automatisiertes Fahrzeug in die Wartung kommt, welche Prozesse da hinterlegt sind. Das sind Punkte, die in sich in den nächsten Jahren sehr, sehr stark verändern werden. Und deswegen ist es schon wichtig, sich heute Gedanken zu machen, ob das heutige Geschäftsmodell passt oder ob man da vielleicht ähm, ja, Veränderungen vornehmen muss. Ja, die Lotsenstelle Transformationswissen BW richtet sich an kleine und mittelständische Unternehmen von der Zulieferindustrie, aber auch vom Kfz-Gewerbe gleichermaßen. Denn auch für Handel und Werkstätten bietet die Digitalisierung große Chancen. Die Lotsenstelle ähm, hat zum einen eine Wettplattform, das heißt, also dort können sich Unternehmensvertreter ähm, über aktuelle Veranstaltungen und zu Qualifizierungsangeboten informieren. Des Weiteren ähm, bietet das Transformationswissen BW eine übersichtliche Suchfunktion für Publikationen zum Wissensaufbau. Denn als Entscheider in der ja, Transformation bedarf man natürlich einer fundierten Faktenbasis, um gute Entscheidungen für die Zukunft des eigenen Unternehmens zu treffen. Und äh, des Weiteren kann man sich an die Lotsenstelle auch direkt wenden. Das heißt, ähm, Lotsen stehen dort zur Verfügung, um einen Überblick über den aktuellen Trend der Transformation und aktuelle Technologien zu geben. Zum einen, zum anderen aber eben auch über die Angebote der Lotsenstelle zu informieren. Und für eine tiefergehende äh, Beratung stehen dann darüber hinaus auch ähm, Berater im Rahmen eines Beratungsgutscheins zur Verfügung. Dieser Beratungsgutschein wird derzeit vom Wirtschaftsministerium aufgelegt und wird voraussichtlich ab Herbst dann zur Verfügung stehen. Die Digitalisierung macht offenbar vor keinem Bereich der Automobilwirtschaft halt. Sichtbar wird sie in Zukunft nicht nur in Karlsruhe. In Form von völlig neuen Fahrzeugen, die, perfekte Algorithmen vorausgesetzt, sogar gänzlich ohne Fahrer auskommen könnten. Solche Technologien werden im Strategiedialog Automobilwirtschaft erprobt. Ein weiteres Beispiel ist Rabus. Dabei geht es um ein Reallabor für den automatisierten Busbetrieb im öffentlichen Personennahverkehr, in der Stadt und auf dem Land. Daran beteiligt sind nicht nur der Automobilzulieferer ZF Friedrichshafen, sondern auch das Forschungsinstitut für Kraftfahrwesen und Fahrzeugmotoren in Stuttgart. Dr. Ulrike Weinrich, Projektleiterin für Kraftfahrzeugmechatronik und Software am FKFS, kennt die Details von Rabus. Das Projekt Rabus ist ein vom Verkehrsministerium Baden-Württemberg initiiertes, geplantes Projekt, bei dem autonom fahrende Shuttles im ÖPNV eingesetzt werden sollen. Hierbei werden dann unter anderem in Friedrichshafen und in Mannheim Fahrzeuge, unter anderem der Firma To Get There, also von ZF, eingesetzt, die eben dann neue Gebiete auch eben erschließen sollen, die für den ÖPNV in der Form, wie er jetzt ist, eben nicht rentabel wären. Die Shuttle-Fahrzeuge bieten den Vorteil, dass sie natürlich einerseits kleiner sind als eben der typische Bus im ÖPNV. Das heißt, man kann sie natürlich in wesentlich kleineren Gebieten oder eben auch kompakteren Gebieten einsetzen. 
Wir haben natürlich auch die Möglichkeit, dass eben durch die immer schwerwerteren Möglichkeiten, neues Fahrpersonal zu finden, eben auch dieses autonome Shuttle eben Fahrten übernehmen kann, für die es im Moment kein Personal einfach wirklich auch gibt. Die Forschungsinhalte vom Projekt Rabus beinhalten unter anderem die Weiterentwicklung dieser Shuttles zum fahren im Level 4 und das heißt, wir haben noch einen Steward an Bord, der eben das Fahrzeug nochmal übernimmt oder die Kontrolle des Fahrzeugs übernimmt, wenn eben das Fahrzeug es nicht mehr selber schafft, mit der Situation zurechtzukommen. Die Möglichkeiten, die sich aber hier bieten, ist eben, dass wir ein vollautonom fahrendes Fahrzeug eben in Mischverkehr haben. Das heißt, wir haben keine eigene Spur mehr für das Fahrzeug, sondern es fährt eben zusammen mit anderen Fahrzeugen, mit Fahrrädern, mit Fußgängern auf diesen äh, Strecken, die eben wir uns ausgesucht haben oder die eben für das Projekt angemeldet sind. Und gleichzeitig in Friedrichshafen werden dann die Fahrzeuge zum ersten Mal auch schneller als 50 km/h fahren können. Ich denke, es hat einen riesen Vorteil, wenn wir autonom fahrende Fahrzeuge haben für eben bestimmte Strecken, bestimmte Abschnitte. Dass wir aber, ich sag mal, in naher Zukunft werden wir diesen vollautonomen Verkehr noch nicht haben. Wir werden einen Mischverkehr haben und da ist es eben auch umso wichtiger, dass eben das autonom fahrende Fahrzeug richtig auf seine Mitfahrer, auf Menschen eben dann auch äh, wieder reagiert. Menschen mit natürlicher und Maschinen mit künstlicher Intelligenz werden in Zukunft also gemeinsam im Straßenverkehr unterwegs sein. Hoch- und vollautomatisierte Fahrzeuge unterschiedlicher Größen ergänzen dann den bekannten Nahverkehr mit Straßenbahnen und Bussen. Dadurch werden flexible Mobilitätsangebote ermöglicht. Lösungen wie jene von Eva Shuttle und Rabus könnten, sofern die Ergebnisse in Hinblick auf Zuverlässigkeit und Wirtschaftlichkeit positiv ausfallen, sogar landesweit etabliert werden. Digitalisierung kann aber auch an Stellen Vorteile bringen, die man als Nutzer niemals zu Gesicht bekommen wird. Etwa die Batteriezellen von Elektrofahrzeugen. Die Produktion solcher Stromspeicher wird in Baden-Württemberg gerade aufgebaut. Das Projekt DigiBud Pro 4.0 will diese Batteriezellenproduktion von vorne bis hinten digitalisieren und dadurch nicht nur die Qualität der Zellen verbessern, sondern auch die Effizienz in der Produktion steigern. Wir haben uns mit den verantwortlichen Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftlern vom Fraunhofer-Institut für Produktionstechnik und Automatisierung in Stuttgart getroffen, ganz analog auf dem Campus. Das Projekt DigiBad Pro 4.0 BW beschäftigt sich mit dem Thema der Digitalisierung des Gesamtprozesses einer Batterieproduktion. Wir sind insgesamt drei Projektpartner, zwei Forschungsinstitute, ZSW und Fraunhofer IPA und ein sehr kompetenter äh, Industriepartner, Warta. Die Projektlaufzeit ist äh, insgesamt zwei Jahre mit einem Projektvolumen äh, von 8 Millionen Euro. Ich denke, Deutschlands Wettbewerbsvorteil in der Batterieproduktion ist die Herstellung hochqualitativer Zellen. Eine Schlüsseltechnologie dabei ist die Herstellung von Elektroden. Um die Qualität von Elektroden bestimmen zu können, müssen sehr viele relevante Daten aufgezeichnet werden. Dafür haben wir hier in Gim Contrace Projekt die Beschichtungsanlage mit zusätzlicher Sensorik ausgebaut. Auch lesen wir anlagenspezifische Daten direkt aus der Steuerung aus. Die Herausforderung dabei ist es, diese Datensätze einzelnen kleinen Elektrodenabschnitten des gesamten Elektrodenbandes zuzuordnen. Dies lösen wir in Contrace mit einem QR-Code. Jedem QR-Code wird ein definierter Abschnitt zugeordnet und diesem Abschnitt die dazugehörigen Datensätze. Die Contrace-Lösung kann einfach und schnell in beliebige Beschichtungsanlagen integriert werden. Dabei können mit Hilfe der Informationen aus Contrace zum Beispiel Fehlstellen frühzeitig detektiert werden, Qualitätsmodelle erstellt werden oder auch Prozesse dynamisch angepasst werden, wie beispielsweise die Mindestmenge der Elektrolytbefüllung. Das Hauptziel ist, einen signifikanten Beitrag zur Steigerung und Stabilisierung der Batterieproduktion zu leisten. Wir nutzen hier alle Industrie 4.0 Werkzeuge und das steigert ziemlich die Produktqualität. Naja, der Vorteil dieser Technologie ist, dass wir keine defekten Akkus mehr produzieren, weil wir frühzeitig Fehlstellen erkennen können. Digitalisierung als Wettbewerbsvorteil für den Industriestandort Baden-Württemberg? Na klar, im Rennen um die Mobilität der Zukunft sind schließlich alle großen Industrienationen dabei. Hier die Stärken bei der Produktion mit den neuen Möglichkeiten der Digitalisierung zu verknüpfen, kann der Schlüssel sein. 
Auf jeden Fall haben wir erlebt, wie viele unterschiedliche Aspekte und Projekte sich hinter dem großen Schlagwort Digitalisierung auftun. Ob fotografierende Kehrmaschinen, Batteriezellen mit QR-Codes oder automatisierte Shuttle-Fahrzeuge im ÖPNV. Die Herausforderungen sind groß, die Möglichkeiten ebenfalls. Fest steht, die neue Vielfalt der Mobilität wird durch Digitalisierung erst möglich. Und in Baden-Württemberg gibt es jede Menge Expertinnen und Experten, die dieser tiefgreifenden Transformation mit tollen Ideen begegnen. Analog und digital. After this short movie break, uh, we are back uh, with our panel discussion uh, in our first session, the software-defined uh, vehicle. Um, so I welcome here our presenters. Uh, uh, to my left, uh, Professor Dr. Eric Sachs uh, from uh, the Karlsruhe Institute for Technology, uh, Erdin Jeschilkaya uh, from the Bertrand Group, and uh, Dr. Christian Schier uh, from AVL Germany. Um, my name is still Wolfgang Fischer. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, we are discussing uh, um, uh, the software-defined vehicle we, we named the, uh, uh, the, the, the session and uh, we, we heard three uh, different perspective, uh, perspectives on, uh, on the software-defined vehicle. But uh, maybe just to start uh, the, the, the question, why uh, is uh, yeah, getting along managing the software-defined vehicle, why is that so important for uh, the companies uh, and, and uh, uh, yeah, all the activities in, in Baden-Württemberg? Maybe I start with Professor Sachs. Yeah, thank you. So the companies, it's interesting you as well, of course, um, because in nowadays the innovation is in software. We have a large flexibility in software and uh, we are other areas of our society uh, are front runners in this area. We have uh, infotainment, we have the uh, individual commercial equipment and, and this is now introduced in the vehicle and this means we have to change our way of thinking and working towards software. Maybe uh, the, the, the two representatives from, from companies. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Yeshikaya, you, you, you pointed out uh, an ecosystem approach for, for companies. I mean, Bertrand uh, is really, uh, uh, yeah, is, is, is just, uh, um, yeah, helping uh, different companies uh, in the development of, of technologies. When you said more an ecosystem approach is uh, important. Um, Is this the only way to, to manage the software-defined vehicle? Uh, it, it is not the only way because, uh, in general, if you're creative enough, you find maybe also different solutions, maybe in your own company, to go in joint ventures maybe. But it helps more to force and get speed up in the market who is really fast in the change now, as you can imagine, the last four or three years. And uh, for, for the question about the software-defined, Tesla is a good example for that, um, how they started and now where they are. Uh, they make some software updates over the year and so like these topics. I think the, the vehicle is just more than a hardware platform for the future to come from point A to B. And uh, I agree with uh, Professor Sachs that he say the software is the relevant thing of the future because there you get more services or solutions what is need of the common generation. Christian Scheer, you as a supplier uh, in, the, in the whole automotive uh, the sector. Supplier for, for engineering and, and test systems, I would like to, to extend the, the, the well statement of Professor Sachs to say the software The innovation is not only in software, there's also a strong hardware-related aspect. Just think about the, in the last two years, um, a dramatic increase in performance of electric motors, yeah? where we have new materials, we have new production concepts. Yeah? So I think the combination of, of course, a strong focus on software, but also to utilize these kind of new capabilities in computing, 
together with optimized material with overall optimized vehicle concept to reduce weight, to increase safety, yeah? uh, to be sustainable on the environment, yeah? to look really for which materials are we mm -hmm. using, are, are these materials which has to be deposited somewhere deep into the ground, or are the materials we can easily recycle and have an excellent uh, quota of, 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 of reuse, uh, just look at the, at the ongoing research in battery materials. Now, what is not only the most performant material combination, but also what is the most sustainable material combination to be, find the, the best possible solution also under these aspects. No? And one big issue now we see since more than one year uh, due to Corona is what will be the, the globalized world in the next years and next decades be? Yeah? It, it won't be like before, look at tourism, look about the mobility needs. So what are the mobility systems which will be in strong demand in the future? Yesterday I read a, a good article about 60% increase in sales of bikes last year. 60%, mm -hmm. that's huge, yeah? I mean, every, every OEM dreams of one digit increase, yeah? I mean, 60%, yeah? Just <laughs> Stupid bikes. Well, they're nice electric bikes. We have a strong, a strong uh, support. So mobility systems are changing, and so have we as engineers to support not only with software technology, but also support with uh, uh, accompanying processes and methods. And, and uh, yeah, just in, uh, 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 yeah, one question that comes to my mind: What, what does the what does that mean for the for the whole production system for the way uh, the, the the different actors on the different stages of the value uh, chain of the supply chain um, uh, is it changing as well of course if uh, i mean you pointed out hardware is changing software is changing uh, maybe uh, yeah of course um, but in the classic way i think you don't have to switch your whole company uh, by the process of production, um, uh, a product or a service. That, I, I think a huge radical change is that not needed, but um, I agree with my colleague in that case that the content of what you are doing in, with, with what you are facing for the future, I think it's more the content-based thing in that case. But I don't think you have to change all your processes in your company. Okay. Um, what, what role does it uh, play the cooperation between, I mean, uh, Eric Sachs, you is, is, is a, a representative from the f from universities, research institutes. What role does the, the cooperation between uh, yeah, research and, and the companies uh, play in, in this case? Do we have to make it faster or more intense? Yeah, uh, to, to bridge what you said uh, to what we do, um, we currently recognize, uh, although of course hardware is improving as well because this is the platform, this is the chance uh, to integrate software, we recognize that the OEMs especially have skills that do not perfectly fit. And therefore they now invent operating systems. Uh, we heard about MBOS and, 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 and Carriet or CSO as former men, uh, called. They, they, they invent operating systems. They want to get back this uh, knowledge and there we can help because mm -hmm. of, we have um, an institute that is able to experiment. An OEM has no chance to experiment. He must have success. Each year success and we are flexible. We can go towards one direction and come back and say no that's the wrong direction or okay. something and of course we have, we have young employees but again it's not the young employees that, ha that, that save the world and in, in, in the middle Europe uh, industry, it will be the, the, the skills of the, of the employees themselves. Um, just uh, to, 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 to uh, grab that, that, that point out, uh, yeah, it has to be secure. Uh, I mean, this is what, what AVL is, is very specialized on, on uh, yeah, security, safety, of, of, uh, um, and of, of course, of, of, of testing. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I mean, in your project, as you pointed out, you're using artificial intelligence um, uh, really as a as a matter uh, of of yeah uh, testing and, and making systems secure. Is is that the, the future way 
Well, I'm, I'm a little bit cautious. Of course, AI is, is now a buzzword in every research um, agenda. You have to provide some AI. Yeah? This is okay. Yeah? I mean, coming, uh, having some uh, controlled background, I mean, 30 years ago, I mean, neural networks, something, nothing new, yeah? Okay, the computers have been, uh, I would say, sub-performant compared to the machinery we have right now, yeah? So uh, AI is a really wide spectrum, now, uh, how you close it. But I would say it's more a shift from a rule-based approach where the mm -hmm. engineer thinks about and say, okay, what are my rules? And then I, I test my system, does it follow all these rules, okay, and then I'm done? more to a data-driven approach to say, okay, I'm collecting data in a wide sense of different domains and, and applications, yeah, and then I put computer science on it, yeah? I put the algorithms on it, so I have not only to change or to, to complement or, uh, the algorithms depending which architecture you're using, no? um, one, one, one actual research is having like hybrid approaches, we have some rule-based um, uh, functions, some AI-based functions, but they have to be accompanied, as we have seen in, in our project. Uh, when you go to a data-driven approach, you have to do a significant change how you handle data. Yeah? And it doesn't come for free uh, to say, oh, I take AI and then I'm done. Yeah? So you have a lot of additional activities yeah, uh, just to, to get the data. How do you, do you scope? How do you get training data? How you make sure if you have a certain level, yeah, um, when you just look at, I don't mention the name, yeah, uh, you do everyday updates over the air. Are they safe enough? When you do it, do it. So you have to change your whole uh, production cycle of, of your system, yeah, taking into account this kind of, maybe it's not a radical shift, it can be piece by piece from a rule-based approach no, and development process topic V cycle to a more agile data-driven process. No? So, so it's not only the function, it's not the system, only the system to be developed, it's also the complete ecosystems around it to make that happen in a good, efficient and, and, and smart way. And uh, ju just uh, uh, yeah, a qu question right, right uh, to, to this uh, topic. Um, uh, you, you mentioned in your presentation uh, the, the regulations. So uh, we have always discussion about regulations in Europe uh, according data protection and everything. Um, is this really a, uh, yeah, is this an, an advantage and disadvantage? Is really the problem for the, for the companies? Uh, from, from our experience in, in another huge project in, in the same funding program, Vivian Methods, where EVL is responsible uh, for the data protection, protection issues for the test vehicles, no? it's a big issue, yeah? because as soon as you start collaborating and sharing this data, you have to follow very strict rules. And if you do not follow them, you 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 up to a huge fine. Yeah? So uh, violating data protection um, is a no-go. Yeah? And that means we have to spend a significant amount of time and money yeah, um, to make sure that all this regulation um, is in place and, and every, everyone uh, not only following it, but also all the complete machinery um, is, is, is fit for that. No? So that, uh, as it, let's call it, a, a privacy data leak doesn't just happen on by coincidence, so mm -hmm. that should never ever happen. And that's a significant amount. And we are still on the learning curve because it's a fairly new regulation, yeah? So also the, the legislation uh, about the details is not, has not been processed through all the level of courts, yeah? Mm -hmm. so, so if you ask, I see you ask two lawyers, you get 10 opinions, yeah? yeah. How to handle that, <laughs> no? That makes it also for the engineers a little bit tricky to say, okay, uh, is it still, uh, how shall we handle that um, from, a, from a legal point of view? No? But I think it's settling down, yeah? And, and uh, as we see, that might be also in the near future or far future also an advantage for our, our European, let's say, approach that we have a very strict uh, regulation on data projects. But still, we, we should not, it should not be a complete showstopper. No? So we have to have this fine line of, of, of keeping the idea and the principles up in a good technical implementation. And yeah, I think that the way uh, uh, the interpretation of the of the regulation is not uh, really uh, uh, the same in in all parts of, of Europe as we as we experience. But Eric Sachs wanted yeah, to. Uh, I, add I want something. to add the moment you have an automated ve vehicle at a pedestrian crossing, you have to check the view of the pedestrian. You have uh, to go into the face. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, you don't see if there's an intention to cross this this street. And, and this is exactly where we currently have laws that, or regulations that are a huge hurdle. And by the way, Far East doesn't have these rules. So mm -hmm. it's sometimes a challenge to do something like that in Middle Europe. 
What, what are your experiences from the, the Bertrand point yeah, of view? Uh, we have more than th 400 uh, test engineers for vehicle data collection worldwide. Uh -huh. I think this regulation about the worldwide data exchange, data security, and uh, more than logistical uh, legislation, uh, um, it makes our work not easy, that's right, but it is also possible to do it in the right way. For uh, example, in some big countries, you are not able to put out the street data to a cloud to make an algorithm analysis in a central base uh, for function development, for example. So that means you have to, for example, as a solution, you have to create a team in that country and make the analysis there, for example, because of the regulation, you couldn't put out that data out of the country, for example, and it's uh -huh. a solution. You have to be creative and flexible in that case. Just on the, on the perspective of a, of a region like, like Baden-Württemberg, so, uh, uh, so, so uh, this we, we were talking about some, yeah, more or less like uh, threats or, or things that uh, are, uh, uh, yeah, not so uh, positive uh, for, for innovation. Uh, on the other hand, uh, to put it in a little bit of positive way, uh, from, from the perspective of, of the region of, of Baden-Württemberg, what, what are the, the advantages, the opportunities uh, to do research and, and of course to do uh, development uh, and, and uh, developing products uh, here here in the region maybe yeah uh, still I think in the automotive industry in middle Europe we are on pole this has to do with our history this has to do with our education with our universities with the skills we have and the processes we can handle and honestly, I think that the processes, methods, and tools are at least as important as the technology itself. Maybe you can buy technology somewhere else on Earth, or maybe you can even um, uh, get that from, from something like Konrad Electronik. But putting the things together and have the processes for the variants, the versions, a worldwide product, this is something we have to save here and we have to, to improve. And I think this is our USP. Yeah, I just can agree with that. And also uh, to put the new players, um, I would say startups, spin-offs, or uh, who, uh, an SMA who wants to grow in the world market maybe, or like to make some innovation supported by the land of Baden-Württemberg, for example, the huge programs we have, a regional land or whole country in Germany, uh, supported by millions of euros in that case, or billions of euros. I think we also support, uh, when we work together and support them, their, um, the, the whole position of Baden-Württemberg will keep on the future also. I would like to, to, to add some comments on, I think, the very interesting statement of Professor Sachs to say um, the OMs or the companies need immediate success. No? That means commercial success. No? And that might be something I think we have, we have to, to think about twice um, because often there is no guarantee for immediate success. No? And then maybe there might be a management decision. Okay, let's maybe go for the more commercial short-term uh, solution and, and not to take too much risk, which might have some financial, let's say, negative impact. But uh, this is also important when we look at my own company I'm working for. Now, we have 10,000 people worldwide with 2 billion turnover every year. Now. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge yeah, to bring the new topics in. And if you compare to the German Mittelstand, especially in Baden-Württemberg, um, I'm not talking about startups, I'm the, the traditional, then it's very difficult for them yeah, to bring in this new technology. Just think about the effort it takes to bring in AI-based concepts in their actual product range. Yeah? So I, I don't even call it transformation. It's just to be, to be still competitive on the global market using these new technologies. Just think about mobile machinery. There's a lot of um, in our in the in the working group um, 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 commercial vehicles uh, in in cluster immobil e very important business uh, not only for Baden-Württemberg but, but for Germany yeah? uh, so all these companies um, we have to work together collaborate in common projects so that also helps these companies to advance yeah to keep up to date with this technology and find their way to apply them no? I think 
it's not the bigger the better, it's also uh, make it happen for, for medium and small organizations that they can cope up. And that's, I think it's very important to have this kind of common pre-competitive research, working together with, with academia, where the people are coming from, yeah? so that they go in the companies and, 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 and bring, bring uh, those companies to a level uh, so that they are competitive on, competitive on, a, global, on a global level. No? So uh, thank you for pointing out the uh, uh, advantages of uh, some network approaches like our cluster electric mobility southwest. Uh, yeah, I, I'd like to, to, to ask the, the, the other two. Is, uh, uh, just working together uh, with uh, companies and research institutes and companies from different branches uh, within some cluster initiatives, network approaches or smaller ecosystems, as, as you said, um, uh, is this more important than it has been? or even important as it always has been, uh, um, or it's getting more and more important, uh, uh, maybe. Please. Yeah, uh, on behalf, uh, the situation is um, situation-based, I will say. Um, if you only network events and do nothing, it was not successful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're in uh, the right network, session like electro cluster software or hybrid or uh, mobility um, there are various also categories of course please select the right one to be efficient and you come out with a solution or a partnership or a, a new business model however what brings you uh, to the success regarding the competitors and so on then it was the right way i say the right place right cluster and uh, right um, topic. But really activities, not only uh, nice really events activities. every, uh, yes. every uh, yeah. uh, few weeks. Uh, so this project orientation is, is very uh, This important. is the one thing. Yeah. Um, and, and honestly, in my daily work or in the daily work of my PhD employees, it's difficult to get data of the companies. They have a lot of hurdles of rules. We have to sign NDAs and the OEMs are very dominant. Take our rules, otherwise we won't work together with you. And then, of course, an institution like mine, which is, uh, has a long history, says, no, we can't accept that immediately. So it takes half a year until we get a little data, a little data. So we need openness. We need a trustful cooperation mm -hmm. that is not only on a meeting level. So I look into your eyes and say, deal. But then the work starts. Right. And this is something um, where, where I think there's really room for improvement. Mm -hmm. If, if we, uh, if we uh, think this uh, uh, thought a little bit further, this means some, some uh, sort of oh, yeah, changing attitude within the organizations, um, right? <laughs> Yeah, currently, may, maybe I may add, we, yeah. we, do, we have too much fear to make, to make something wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, there have some, been some examples, we have compliance, we have monitors in the company, and so everybody says, oops, 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 I don't dare to do that, and ask my boss, ask my boss, and you need a signature of somebody who does not really know what he is sign, signing there. And therefore, hey, uh, we, we need simplification of that. Not too much processes on that, please. <laughs> I mean, it's just what we see from our perspective in the in the last years. I mean, there there has been some kind of of Silicon Valley tourism a few years ago. Uh, uh, yeah, and 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 really, we we just uh, saw, especially by the large companies, very much efforts to change the way they work within the company, uh, and of course, in, in some kind of way, uh, just uh, cooperating with others, but uh, all these uh, restrictions uh, you said, of course, are, are, are still existing. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, is, uh, you, you already uh, uh, said a, a few minutes ago, uh, there's no need to change all your processes and everything, but uh, is it more just, uh, 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 just to, to, to get along with this more software-defined uh, world? Is it, is, it pos uh, is it necessary to have some sort of uh, yeah, change of the mindset uh, be be behind it? Yeah, that's the right word. That's the hashtag overall, actually. Uh, also in our company and out of the company, I agree, uh, mindset change. 
be more mm -hmm. smooth, be more um, uh, trusty to your partner, and afterwards you start thinking or uh, making some projects, then maybe fill in the regulation because someone's coming and proving that, of course, because you have an audit but uh -huh. maybe not the first time to, to start the discussion after six months. Uh, six months is a huge time actually for topics of software or di digitalization. Mindset change, hashtag. Okay. How's the change of mindset in, uh, at AVL? I mean, you, you already pointed out, I mean, AVL is, is very active in, in our cluster, very much in cooperation with Research Institute, as you pointed out, as the KISMAP project or Smart Load uh, project. Well, I have the honor to work for a private company where our owner, I think, is, is really uh, puts a strong focus on research. No? So we have a significant budget every year for research, which is not usual in our industry or given at any other company. So we are, by the way, not a startup founded in 1948. Yeah? <laughs> so it's a couple of years behind us. Yeah? And uh, I really, I really uh, appreciate this kind of, as I mentioned before, that you do not have to give a, a highly return of invest next year for anything you do. Yeah? So if, if you have something and you're convinced, then there, should, there is a period where you, where you can also go through the the valley of tears, as to say, no? which you have in any in any development. So after the first hype, it goes down. No? Once I had the honor to meet the now the CEO of a fairly large Japanese OEM, no? talk to him to five minutes, no? and he explained that when he he was in, in charge of developing such a hybrid concept, no? it was one of many. But he was convinced of that, and he it took a while. It took a lot of money. It took a lot of time. Yeah, but then it was. It, Looking back now, more than 20 years, it was the right decision. Huh? So to have this long-term perspective and really do not change the plan every day when, when the investors come and say, hey, where is our money, yeah? our return of invest? Go through, be honest, never cheat, yeah? but take a controlled risk yeah? and, and never follow all, the, when every, all experts on the market are, have one opinion, just rethink it again. Huh? So make your own opinion and, 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 and make what you're convinced for and where also your data um, uh, supports that, huh? data in a way of, of conceptual studies and so on. So I, I really appreciate um, uh, projects where, where there's room for, also for failure, to say, okay, this, out of these 10 concepts, nine didn't really work well, but they want, that's it, no? and then just get it through. Uh, I think this was one main part of this uh, Silicon Valley tourism, the, the failure culture. Uh, yeah. uh, this was a buzzword uh, a few years ago. But uh, um, uh, one, uh, Eric Sachs, uh, after your presentation, we, we already uh, started discussing it. I think uh, one main point is uh, the field of qualification. Of course, you, you see a lot of students coming uh, from school to, to, to university. Um, so... Uh, have we have we, uh, of course we, we have a lot of different uh, ways to study uh, and um, uh, hopefully a lot of more people getting more into the software topics but have to ha have we uh, just um, yeah uh, try to, to stress that sooner already in school well, what are your experiences with uh, with your your students yeah the one thing is that as well a university needs to be more flexible change the content of the lectures and the laboratories um, in higher frequency. This is one thing we have to do. But not only the students are enough to save uh, the innovation in the companies. It must be intrinsic. It mm -hmm. must come from themselves. And therefore, I'm convinced that a university needs to change their offers for employees that are, have experience to a certain extent in companies. Even we offer now top management qualification okay. so that top management knows what is agile. Everybody talks about that. Consultants talk about that or they talk about um, AI. Uh, what is that? How, how does such an algorithm work? How does a neural network work? This might be only a day of qualification, but this is needed and we as well have to offer that to the companies. So as uh, representative of the companies? And training is uh, also inside the company in combination with the university, universities or network groups necessary. That means know-how exchange, know-how increasing, uh, 
uh, employee qualification um, on top level, like we know Baden-Württemberg as well the last years, with most of patents in the world we have here. Uh, as known, and I'm proud about especially the dual system, and that what you mean, Professor Sachs, is a dual system that means you have experience by work, by project, and you transfer it to the universities, and other hand, the universities have the capability and the need to know and learn new and engage them for the projects, for the companies to work together and learn, learn there. That means this dual system uh, here in Germany, uh, especially in Baden-Württemberg, uh, is really fine and I hope that that will proceed on. Uh, additionally, with maybe more uh, F, um, or pro position project-based um, uh, programs. And just more flexibility, uh, I think this is the key word for, for everything, if you, uh, the normal studies, but uh, of course the, the qualification on the job, uh, AVL. <laughs> What's your uh, uh, what's the, the uh, perspective of your company on training and qualification? Well, uh, as mentioned by Professor Sachs and my colleague here, is uh, I think there are different levels of, of uh, call it education training, yeah, and and they are, they are overlapping now, yeah. So on one side we have highly skilled people, yeah, developing combustion engines, yeah. Mm. The business is not, I think, the outlook is not too good, yeah? <laughs> so I would not um, uh, recommend my sons to study you know, combustion engineering technology, yeah? Maybe in a, in a different context, yeah? Um, one of my sons is, likes rockets now and he tries uh, to fly to Mars maybe in the future or not. <laughs> I'll see, yeah? So combustion is not a bad process, yeah? Uh, in a different context, no? um, uh, But it's, it's that this, uh, this education... Um, will not be you learn something and you do it the rest of your life, never ever, that will be completely changing. No? We have massive digitalization, a lot of things can be done from home. We do not need a certain infrastructure, which I think is now also a, a key to success, has been in the past, isn't currently, will it be in the future, to have an excellent infrastructure, machinery to work with. Still we have materials, yeah? I mean, uh, all of my colleagues working in labs, not, they, they go to the lab, yeah? Um, in worst case, they, they work from home office in the lab, yeah? Uh, we, we have uh, successfully done a project in, in Japan uh, last six months, completely remotely, no? uh, out of, of, of travel restriction. It can be done, it takes a little longer, you have to get people used to it. No? So this way of working together, also to educate people remotely. No? That's, uh, I think when you look what happens now in, 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 in homeschooling and, and lockdown or not, yeah, that will stay, that will change our way how we educate our next generation, how we educate ourselves, educate the older people like me. Yeah? Uh, but I think the interesting thing is looking at all different levels, be interested, be curious. Yeah? Try things out, yeah? And I fully agree with what Mr. Sachs. We have to give them also the, the opportunity to try something out. No? And this is not only sitting in front of the computer programming something, is to do something useful with this programming. No? So you always have this kind of hardware-related aspects, be it production, be it development, yeah? be it a human-machine interface, all of these things. Um, have to be have to be done in in a, in a consistent way of, of continuously exploring things and and saying oh I have new capability that's fine I, I can I learn something new if uh, some side like more some side like less yeah but the opportunity that I can also apply these things is uh, uh, very important when you when you gain knowledge no just to read a book or do a webinar yeah that's half of the story to apply it mm -hmm. and to have your own little success story yeah. In, in the things you, you acquired with new skills at all levels, no? That, that's uh, important. Is it for that reason important to have some, uh, uh, actually we are talking about this uh, in, uh, in detail uh, uh, tomorrow morning, but uh, to have really like uh, publicly funded test sites as, as we have for example in, in Karlsruhe, but also in, in Friedrichshafen and, and things, really to, to give the, uh, yeah, just to, to, to set the stage for, for companies and research institutes to, to try things out, especially uh, as in Karlsruhe, one, one, uh, yeah, one, one point of the, 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 the test field for autonomous driving in Karlsruhe is that it's in the public, uh, so uh, you can just uh, get the users in, 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 in this, this, this process. Is it important to, to have things like this, or, or is it more like the, the company has have to try it uh, out for themselves? Um, in my opinion, it's very important to have something like this, 
but not mainly to have a new approach or application or test field is a little bit misleading as well because we are not testing um, because it's too dangerous to test uh, within the, the public traffic. But we have to come out of our ivory tower. This is very important. We, we do not work behind a wall. We, we, we want to have an, an, an exchange with society. Do we do the right things? What about acceptance of what we are doing? What about nah, uh, how does this vehicle drive in an, in an um, urban environment? And this is the point where I say it's very important to have public recognized projects and a lot of work is done in the labs of the university or the companies jointly, hopefully jointly. Yes, that's right. Um, in Friedrichshafen especially, we um, discussed about this topic more than two and three years now. Okay. It is also based on a network event. How could we do that? Uh, Arbeitsgruppe, like uh -huh. a working group. Uh, and that is one directly use case which is also realized. And that's good to see that it's not a theoretical discussion. It is also realized in Friedrichshafen. Now we as an engineer, after uh, testing in labs, now we connect in the whole city or the street along that uh, direction is now connected to the cars. And we also involved in that project, for example, get some data and um, um, the citizens know that this has happened and more acceptance for the future of mobility is also given as a, a secondary aspect as well. As you mentioned already. Uh, well, I just uh, want to, to uh, add some comments what Professor Sachs said. I think the test fields, uh, this is really the, the interface to the public, no? where we say, okay, um, not only to put some sensors, to put some vehicles in yeah, at, a certain, at a certain level of development, but really to, to try out how, what, what are things we might miss in the overall story. No? Um, uh, are, have we done enough to, 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 to promote the acceptance? Just remember back uh, a long time when, when e-mobile Baden-Württemberg started with electric mobility. So a lot of people, I don't want to name them now, yeah, thought that the idea to put big batteries and electric motors in vehicles is a bad idea. Yeah? That doesn't work. It's too expensive expensive, never works, it's unsafe or whatever. Yeah? So, so to, for this kind of new, new things, and I'm sure uh, the future will be not that what, you will, what everyone prognoses. Yeah? The future will be always different and surprising. Yeah? Just think one and a half years back, COVID, what's that? No? So, 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 but to be, to be curious, to be active, to react fast yeah? in a good, Honest way, I think that's the key to success also in, in our mobility industry, which has this now big shift to, to a more data-driven approach, no? to more automation. And, and, and I mean, we should make a good job to provide something useful to the society. Yeah? Yeah? So, and I think there's a lot of room to do for us as engineers. No? So, um, test fields are, are the first step into a successful industrialization. Okay. No? Yeah, thank you. Just uh, looking at the timer <laughs> behind the camera, um, I would like to do a, a, yeah, a, a small uh, a short round. I would uh, love to uh, go on discussing with you, but uh, uh, we have to look at the time frame. So, uh, yeah, the question would be, we, we already dis discussed a lot of different aspects. Uh, and uh, uh, looking uh, at Baden-Württemberg, so this is the, the Baden-Württemberg portfolio, uh, we were quite successful in the combustion technology uh, in, in the automotive sector, as Eric Sachs said. We were very good in, in uh, have a very good market position uh, today in the, in the automotive sector. So, what is, in your opinion, really just to, to try to, to sum it up, what, what's really the one or two key points uh, to be successful in the upcoming era of, of a more software de defined? Uh, automotive industry or the software defined vehicles or as we want to name it. Maybe we start with Professor Sachs. <laughs> yeah, oh. <laughs> it's, it's difficult to give an advice. Uh, maybe maybe in, in, in short words, don't look back too much. Um, even if we go through a valley of tears, as you mentioned, in some technology, uh, dare to change, although and, and this is the innovator's dilemma. We have, let's say, we have the best products, okay. But now we have to jump. 
and we have to make statements. And they should not look back, but think about the future. And, and this is the piece of advice I would like to give. Thank you. Yeah, in my words, I would say, see the opportunities and look into your strengths, what makes you or what have made you successful, what could make you successful, maybe with whom you could more successful. And this is maybe the sentences now I will give to you uh, this round. Well, I, I would wish that in, in Baden-Württemberg in, in the next years there is also a revival of, of different mobility systems where successful companies here in the area are successful. Just think an example of rail systems, no? think about shipping, inland shipping, yeah? um, uh, think about the digitalization of construction industry. When you look outside on the roads, on, on, on how, how things are built, I would say there is a lot of improvement. Yeah? Using mobility systems to make those, those, those domains more efficient. Yeah? So I think we have an excellently optimized traditional domain of, of private cars on, on high-speed highways. Yeah? And there's a lot of other domains where there's a huge room for improvement to bring in smart systems, a lot of IT, yeah? together with smart materials, of course. No? And smart vehicle concepts. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so, uh, gentlemen, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, this very interesting round. Uh, yeah, as, as I noted, uh, I, I'm taking uh, away with, with me the thought, really, have the courage to try something out. Uh, trust yourself and your abilities, uh, but also trust your partners uh, in, a, in a strong network. So, um, yeah, it was a pleasure, really, to hear your presentations, to uh, discuss with you. Uh, and, yeah, um, at this uh, point, uh, we are now uh, yeah, going into the lunch break, uh, <laughs> and we will uh, back again. Uh, so, uh, actually, we are already, uh, we, we are always, uh, we are still working on the, the, the field of uh, 3D printing to have you uh, served uh, a lunch <laughs> on your uh, computers at home. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so I leave you for the next hour. Uh, uh, thanks again uh, to our presenters. Um, uh, and uh, we see each other again at 1 p.m., uh, with the speech of uh, our Minister for Economics, uh, Dr. Nicole Hofmeister-Kraut, for that, uh, from, so this for now. Uh, yeah, enjoy your meal. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and we see you later. Thank you. Baden-Württemberg? No, no, no. Baden-Württemberg. Baden, what? Baden-Württemberg. Baden-Württemberg. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you all to the official opening of the Pavilion of Baden-Württemberg here at BW Digital at Hannover 2021. Great to have you with us here today. My name is Kimsi von Reischach and it is my pleasure to be your host and moderator over the course of the next three days. And let me tell you, we have a fantastic program lined up for you. So I hope you don't have any plans for the next three days. And if you do, maybe consider canceling them. Now, Hannover Messe and of course also the Pavilion of Baden-Württemberg attract many, many visitors. And we would like to know now from you, dear ladies and gentlemen, where are are you watching us from today? Now, if you are joining us on the Baden-Württemberg platform, um, as well as the Hannover Messe platform, a questionnaire window, slider, or the Q&A window will open up just to the left of you. And just right into that window, where are you watching us from today? And uh, while I can see uh, many of you are entering their answers already, I can let you know in the meantime where we are streaming from today. We have a fantastic studio set up right here in the center of Stuttgart at the urban offices. We've got a great technical team here. We've got a huge space. And so the Corona distances are um, for sure in effect here. So let's have a look um, at the answers. Okay. We have viewers from Freiburg. We have viewers from Sweden. Great to have you with us. Trier, Tübingen, of course, Stuttgart, and also Pforzheim. Also an important note at this point, ladies and gentlemen, we are recording this session and all questions and answers on Slido will be visible for all to see. Um, New York. Hello, New York. I miss New York. Great that you're with us here today. We have Trier and a um, couple more answers coming in. Pforzheim, of course, is with us here today too. So great to see that we have viewers from all across the globe with us here today in the Baden-Württemberg Pavilion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce a very special welcome message to you, which was recorded by Baden-Württemberg's Minister for um, Economic Affairs for labor and also for housing. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Nicole Hofmeister-Kraut. Dear Mr. Herzog, dear digital exhibitors, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to have the privilege to launch the joint company stand at the Hannover Messe together with you. We have had to wait a long time for this. Of course, I would have liked to be there in person. Nevertheless, I'm very glad that we have this opportunity to virtually present our federal state and our innovative products and services, particularly in times of great economic and political challenges. Being able to showcase our expertise and know-how at an international industrial trade fair sends an important signal. I would like to begin by thanking our partners who have made this digital platform possible. Baden-Württemberg International and the federal agencies E-Mobil BW and Leichtbau BW, as well as Allianz Industrie 4.0. But of course, my thanks also go to you, dear exhibitors, who have remained loyal, even if in a changed and digital form. Very special thanks also go, to, go out to our international partners from Ontario in Canada, North Brabant in the Netherlands and Grand Est in France, who will be participating in virtual activities with us. Dear ladies and gentlemen, Hannover Messe addresses future issues and trends in industry. This year's slogan is Home of Industrial Pioneers. It seems made for our federal state. Baden-Württemberg is the leading innovative and industrial region in Europe. Our mechanical engineering companies equip the world's factories and are world leading with regard to Industry 4.0. Our companies drive innovation and provide solutions throughout all areas of industrial transformation. Be it intelligent production, energy and resource efficiency or climate neutral production and mobility. And we are very well placed to continue to play a leading role in the trends of the future. We have our global players a strong, diverse sector of small and medium-sized enterprises, which include many hidden champions and an excellent research sector. Our goal must be future made in Baden-Württemberg to establish our innovative machines, products and services as a brand in the global market. But for that, we will need to get better at bridging the gap between research and commercial applications. We will build on proven structures and develop them further, also in the direction of new and sustainable growth areas. 
so that we can continue to be the world leading industrial location in the future. For example, by placing great importance on artificial intelligence, we have already launched many projects to ensure that Baden-Württemberg will be an internationally known center of value creation, particularly in the field of AI. I'm convinced that we have to do our utmost to encourage and support innovation. Innovations and investing in key technologies will strengthen Baden-Württemberg's role as an industrial location in the long term and keep it fit for the future. But I also strongly believe in close cooperation with our European neighbours. If nothing else, the coronavirus pandemic has shown us that we are only as strong as our partners. And that even in times of crisis, we must not seal ourselves off. The closing of borders should therefore, in my view, be only a last resort. Not just on economic grounds, but also for social and political reasons. Dear ladies and gentlemen, with digital trade fairs, we are all breaking new ground. But we will certainly be dealing with digital aspects in the future, for example, in the form of hybrid events. I would now like to wish the Hannover Messe every success and I look forward to new and exciting insights. Once again, I would like to thank everyone involved and wish all exhibitors all the best and successful business contacts. Thank you very much, Minister Hofmeister Kraut, for this very special video message. Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready for our next guest. Our next guest will be joining us digitally in just a few moments. It is my pleasure to introduce to you none other than the CEO of Baden-Württemberg International. Please welcome Dr. Christian Herzog. Christian, great to have you here. How are you doing? Fine, Kim. Thank you very much for your warm words and kindly welcome. Thank you very much. So, I have a pleasure to welcome you all to our first um, digital Baden-Württemberg at Hannover Messe. So it's really great for us to be part of it, to organize it with you all together. Yeah, my name is Christian Herzog. I'm the CEO, as I mentioned, of Baden-Württemberg National. And it's a real, real pleasure to welcome you all on the screens at your home, in the offices, and wherever you are at the moment. Maybe some few words about Baden-Württemberg National. We are the economic development agency of the state of Baden-Württemberg. In a nutshell, we are supporting companies from out of Baden-Württemberg, science institute, universities to go abroad to enter for a market and vice versa for sure. If any one of you out there is interested in the German market, in the European market, um, maybe think about to start from out of Baden-Württemberg. And I will give you three reasons why. The first thing is we are home of global players. We are home of industry pioneers. We have global brands like Porsche, like Bosch, like SAP, like Daimler, but even a huge amount of innovative German Mittelstand companies. It's a melting pot of innovation, of experience, and of disruption. It's part of our DNA for more than 100 years. So we are belonging to Europe's leading technology areas. The second point is we are in innovation region number one in Europe, if you um, count how many much money we are spending into R&D at all. It's around about 5% all GDPs um, invested in R&D in Baden-Württemberg. That's really unique. That's only possible because we have a unique landscape of science, research and development. And last but not least, we have the federal state with the highest export rate. So we are well known in the world with huge networks you can use. To say it in words from soccer world, a loving soccer is you can decide on your own if you want to play Champions League, uh, only taking part in the European Cup. So the next three days, we have around about 50 companies, universities, research institutions from Baden-Württemberg in the fields of mobility, of energy, of light rate, of energy, of industry 4.0, and for sure of artificial intelligence. They all are ready to meet, to discuss the innovation solution with you. And I'm really keen on looking forward to the next days. 
um, looking what can be possible in the future. Anything can be possible. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Christian, let's talk about Hannover Messe for a minute. Uh, can you tell um, us and our viewers, um, in your opinion, what makes Hannover Messe so special and why did you decide to link your event to this very first uh, big step into the digital world with this digital edition? Yeah, for sure. Honestly, it has never been a question to take part and to take part in. I think Sanofa Messe is, is the world's most important platform for digital transformation, for industrial transformation, for industrial technologies. And your leading topic of the Hannover Messe this year and the industrial transformation is a perfect fit to Baden-Württemberg. Because, as I mentioned before, innovation is part of our DNA, it's part of our history. So um, we are reinvesting 5% of the GDP in R&D each year. And that's the reason for deciding to link our event to the first digital edition of the Hannover Messe. Because I am a huge fan of the Hannover Messe. I think Baden-Württemberg edition is a huge fan of the Hannover Messe. And I think we can do a lot in the future. And we will even broadcast these um, platform uh, on the Hannover Messe platform next three days. So um, I'm very keen on to take a look on each of the panels of the keynotes and even of the pitches. There's so much going on now. Of course, we're going to have a larger audience. We're going to have a more international audience. So what can this larger and more international audience, Christian, what can they expect in terms of topics and also structure of the next three days? So it's all about pitching, honestly. It's all about solution. Let's discuss the future. So it's um, the exhibitors will present their solutions. They will take part in pitch sessions. They will be available for Q and A sessions. And if you're interested in, you can get in one-to-one -one meetings at networking events, all three days. We have focus on three topics on three days. The first thing is for sure mobility. Um, who else can talk about mobility than Baden-Württemberg? It's one of the most discussed areas um, worldwide, but even the most emotional discussion we have actually, because everyone you ask to mobility has an own opinion how future of mobility looks like. Everybody has an um, suggestion what we can do better. And if you take a look on Baden-Württemberg, that's 30% of all um, turnover industrial is made uh, is actually done by by the Vihaige uh, manufacturing industry. So we have a huge wave of challenge before us concerning um, industrial transformation. But on the same level, we have a lot of offerings, a lot of ideas, solutions. You can take a look, especially on Monday. And at that point, thank you to Emobile, who is organizing the first day, the Monday today. It's a state center agency for innovation and mobility. And they are supporting the automotive industry um, in challenging times of industrial transformation. The second thing is um, we have lightweight engineered path and solution. Well, the, the technology is a key asset for sustainable economy. From product concept to design method to new materials, lightweight technology enhances all stages of value creation process. And we have um, Leichbau BV who are leading um, a, a, the second day with a lot of, of discussion panels and keynote slots. It's a huge network of around about 2,200 companies and more than 300 research facilities. So it's your one-stop agency if you want to know more about lightweight technologies. And for sure, it's the digital ecosystem. We have our backbone of the German industry are the um, small and medium enterprises, <clears throat> our German Mittelstand, so-called. Yeah, They have huge challenges on digital transformation. But even here, you have great partnerships like the Network Alliance Industry 4.0. They bundle competences from production, information, and communication technologies and offer support service to all those SMEs who have questions how to solve these problems, how to face these challenges. And for sure, digitalization is changing every part of today's life, not only in the private sector, but even in the science and research, even in the economy and society sector. And hopefully Baden-Württemberg is quite well prepared. I can ensure that we are quite well prepared concerning artificial intelligence.
Yeah, we have clusters like a Cyber Valley, we have in tubing, we have digital hub in Karlsruhe and many more. And you can um, Tuesday afternoon get a deeper insight into this AI ecosystem of the Cyber Valley. And thanks to Allianz 4.0, who organized an exciting program on Wednesday, ranging from security industry networks to transform production processes to training and competences needed by the workforce. So I'm really sure that we will get some good connecting point, good talks, and hopefully making some real business, um, if it's possible, on a digital way. Of course, I'm very sure it is very possible. Now, this year, you also have very strong international partners on board. Christian, what can you tell us about those? They're, they're really, really great. So we are very um, close partnership, for example, to Ontario um, in, a, in an area of artificial intelligence, for example. We have um, very close partnerships on the automotive sector. We have similar challenges, similar structures um, we are serving so in Ontario, for example, even in, in Baden-Württemberg. It's the same like the Netherlands, like North Brabant, for example. Yeah, They opened in Baden-Württemberg an AI hub, which is a combined hub between Germany and Netherlands. So I think we are dealing with the same topics. We're facing the same challenges. And I think nobody can act alone. We need partnerships. We need international collaboration, not only on the way of traveling, I'm missing Ontario, I'm missing New York, as you said in your introduction. Um, I miss all those places to see what's happening. But honestly, um, if it's possible to deal on digital way, we should take the chance to do that. Fantastic. And we're definitely offering lots of these chances in the course of the next three days. Kristen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for the official opening. And I would say this was so much fun. Why don't we meet again at the end for the official closing? What do you say? Yes, absolutely. I'm looking forward. Great. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Christian Herzog, he's the CEO of Baden-Württemberg International. Now, dear viewers, as mentioned just a little bit earlier, today's main topic is energy and mobility solutions, and it is organized by Emobil BW. And if you would like to find out more about their field of work and also the very varied programs that they offer, you can inform yourself. If you're joining us on the Baden-Württemberg site, it's very easy. Uh, talk, which is the platform we are using, uh, you go into the top line all the way to the right, and there you have a, a little field called Emobil. Just click on that to get more information. If you are joining us on the official Hannover Messe platform, uh, then you can get information very easily um, by going to the exhibitor profile uh, to find out more about Immobil BW for more information. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a very short break now. We are going to be back at 1.30 with our very first keynote of the day. And uh, it will be coming to you from Professor Dr. Fleischer. He's from the Excellence University of the KIT, the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And he, ladies and gentlemen, will be talking to you about agile, modular and vehicle production. By the way, all streamed content that you can see today, tomorrow and also on Wednesday will be available on the Baden-Württemberg platform, which is Talk, as I just mentioned, uh, starting tomorrow takes a minute to upload and it will be available until the end of May. So if you should miss a session, don't worry, you can watch it at a later time until the end of May. So I'm going to be back, ladies and gentlemen, at 3.30 for our very first round of exhibitor pitches, um, where you get to find out more about exciting and innovative companies and enterprises from Baden-Württemberg. And not only do you get to know a little bit more about them, you get to ask them your questions directly in a Q&A session, which will be at the end of every exhibitor pitch. And of course, the exhibitor pitches today will be topically um, in the area of energy and mobility solutions. So have a great day right here with us in the pavilion of Baden-Württemberg at BW Digital at Hannover Messe 2021. I'll see you later. So...
hello, we are back again. Uh, um, hopefully you enjoyed uh, your lunch break. Uh, thank you very much to the colleagues from Baden-Württemberg uh, International uh, uh, for normally for the good cooperation uh, um, about our Baden-Württemberg pavilion on the fair uh, and of course for the good cooperation this year in organizing these stream conferences uh, um, uh, to the Hannover fair. So welcome uh, on behalf of uh, the Emobile BW for all viewers uh, who did not see our streaming program uh, this morning. My name is Wolfgang Fischer. Uh, I'm divisional head of project and cluster activities at the Emobile BW. That's the short version for the state agency for new mobility solutions and automotive Baden-Württemberg. Um, in our session this afternoon, uh, we talk about uh, new added value through key components. Uh, um, in, the, in the morning, we talked a lot about technological change concerning um, electrification and digitalization uh, of mobility, of the mobility system, of course, of the automotive and mobility industry. And there are several key components. And what is changing as well is the, the, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, the manner uh, how we can produce uh, all these key components. Uh, for that, uh, I'm very happy uh, that we have an uh, expert uh, from uh, the Karlsruhe University uh, um, uh, here uh, who will present us uh, um, uh, uh, his thoughts uh, and his research uh, concerning new value creation by introducing agile um, production concepts. Um, uh, I will say welcome uh, to Professor Jürgen Fleischer. Um, uh, Professor Dr. Jürgen Fleischer studied mechanical engineering at the University of Karlsruhe in Germany, um, received his doctorate in 1981. Since 1992, uh, he has been uh, holding several leading positions in industry before he uh, started his career. He has been appointed professor and director of the WBK, that's the Institution of uh, Production Science at the Karlsruhe Institute uh, of Technology. Um, he was appointed professor in 2003. Uh, furthermore, he holds a visiting professorship at the Tongchi University in Shanghai since 2012, and he is a recognized member of the scientific community and involved in several national and international societies, for example, the German Academic Society for Production Engineering uh, or the International Academy for Production Engineering. Um, of course, he is uh, also active as member in uh, various uh, scientific and industrial advisory boards, so he's an absolute expert uh, about actual production of uh, components uh, for um, new mobility solutions. So um, I say uh, welcome to Professor Jürgen Fleischer. We are looking forward uh, to uh, your presentation and we're happy you're here. Thanks for joining us. So the floor and the stage is yours. Thank you, Herr Fischer, for this nice introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to talk to you today on new value generation by introducing agile production systems. Baden-Württemberg is famous for its machinery industry and also for the automotive industry. And there is a long uh, development ongoing. It started after the Second World War and that was a nice time in terms of production because the market uh, was a very pushy market and you see the number of Volkswagens here um, and uh, over the time, uh, basically the turnover went up and up and it was easy to produce because we had more or less only one uh, type of vehicles. If we look at uh, Volkswagen uh, today, then you see how many different variants have been developed over the last years. And uh, so it's very difficult now to make the production equipment which is able to cope with all these variants and at the same time which is also able to cope with the volume which is more or less uh, going up and down. We have no steady market anymore. We have volatile markets and we have a strong trend towards customization which you see if you look at all these different variants. And therefore, for us as machine builders, um, 
the big challenge is that we have to make machinery which is able to cope with the challenges of volatile markets. We uh, want to introduce to you uh, today the, the concept of agile production concepts which should be able to bring us also in the area of electromobility from a production point of view um, in, in a leading uh, position. Let's review first the different challenges which we have uh, in these volatile markets. So one is for sure we have a high uncertainty of sales forecasts as a result of significant changes in the usage behavior. This is driven by digitization and uh, it's also driven by the aim to have uh, sustainable mobility concepts. So the customer demand, which you see on the left hand side of the picture, the customer demand, there are some question marks. We don't know exactly what the customers want to have in some years from now. On the right hand side, you see the aspect of supply chains. We have uh, experienced that we have a high risk of breakdowns due to economical and technical uh, needs um, of these complex supply chains. So this is another obstacle we have to master. We have economic uh, frame conditions, which lead also to a high volatility as a result of international trade conflicts and resulting restrictions. We are not mastering the whole supply chain back to the mines, so to say. And we have also in Europe legal frame conditions and um, especially due to the climate change requirements, uh, we have um, a high uncertainty what will be produced, how much of that will be produced, how many variants will be produced. We don't know. And the question now is, how are our production equipment, how is our production equipment designed and is it able to cope with these requirements? We hear a lot of the mega factor, giga factories for batteries and if you compare these gigafactories, which are announced uh, from a production point of view with what we have seen in traditional combustion engines in the past, then we have to say these gigafactories are basically conventional transfer lines, as Henry Ford has them introduced already in 1920. A transfer line is a rigid, high productive uh, line of consequent uh, production steps, but the transfer line is not able to cope with different variants. It's unflexible. You also have a problem with the scalability and also the investment is rather high. On the right hand side of the picture, you show the normal cost decretion um, as a function of uh, the number of units to be produced. And in a transfer line, you are basically uh, designing this line for a certain fixed volume of production. And if the market is not giving you this volume, then the line is not economical and you lose money. If you need more, then the, 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 the operation point uh, of this uh, transfer line allows you then you also have additional cost and you lose money. So the high risk is also with our battery uh, factories, we are making a kind of transfer line, which is good to have a mass production of always the same with a stable production volume. But is that really the future? If the future is that volatile, as we discussed uh, in the previous slides, then we need a concept for production, which is more a system of building blocks, like Lego bricks. And uh, this concept needs to be agile. It needs to be able 
to produce not only one type, but also more types of a product. And it also needs to be agile in order to cope with varying volume. So if you have a Lego brick uh, doing a certain assembly operation and your volume, your demanded volume from the market is going up, then you just add another Lego brick. Or if um, the volume goes down for a certain type of uh, uh, products, then you give the Lego brick another mission and you reuse it for another product. So we want to go away from the rigid mass production equipment to a more flexible, agile system of building blocks, which allows us to configure and reconfigure our production according to the needs of these volatile markets. And that is called an agile production system. One example, for example, one example could be the motor production, the electric motor production. We don't know how many electric motors we will see um, and how many internal combustion engines we will have. We have to make sure that our equipment can cope with all possible scenarios. And here you see, for example, a hairpin motor for the electric uh, driving, which uh, consists of several process steps. First, you need to form the so-called hairpins. Then you assemble these hairpins and you weld them together. By that, you make, so to say, the normal winding of a motor. And uh, the final step is the testing. So this is a consequent uh, process chain. And if you would put that in a transfer line, then you have for each of these process steps, and this is on the left-hand side of the picture, uh, on each, uh, for each of these process steps, you have a functional unit. And uh, the tech time for each of these functional units is well balanced, so you achieve a very high productivity. However, you are not in a position to cope with other variants of these motors or with uh, varying volumes. And this is possible on the right-hand side by using an agile production system. What you see here is that for each operation, you have redundant uh, uh, process equipment. And if the volume is increasing, you add for each of these um, process steps additional Lego bricks or boxes. And if the volume goes down, you remove them and build another line in a very quick uh, way uh, by reusing these building bricks, which are not used anymore for the first line I mentioned. So this is our real uh, challenge. And Baden-Württemberg and all the machine builders in Baden-Württemberg, they are famous for this flexible and agile production system. In the past, more for the internal combustion engines and the, the gearboxes and so on. In the future, as I hope, also for batteries and also for electric motors and fuel cells. And such an agile production system is basically a system of well-planned uh, uh, Lego bricks, which you, could, which you can put together to uh, allow you to make a certain product. And such units need to be very flexible. So robotic, uh, robotics and uh, programmable kinematics play a major role on that. And um, if you want to take the box on the right-hand side, and want to make it flexible so that it can adapt itself to different products or at least different variants of products, then you need uh, kinematic-based uh, flexibility. You also need to make um, the movements in a way that you don't need 
rigid tools, so you basically program the tool, and you need software-defined uh, processes so that the whole thing, what is going, in, uh, going on in this box, can be offline programmed and can also be online monitored. Such uh, flexible boxes are basically the basis of the agile production systems. And you see, again, this modularization uh, approach on the right-hand side. On the system level, you have the big green box, but the big green box uh, has clear interfaces to smaller boxes, which fit very well to the uh, big box. And uh, you can, from a system level, go down to a module level, go down to a process level. And everything is modular, configurable, exchangeable. And out of these building blocks with well-defined interfaces, you can configure and reconfigure in a very short period of time your production line so that it fits perfectly to the volatile market I talked about before. And there are some requirements to be fulfilled in order to be that flexible and agile as discussed. One is each box or each production process needs to be able to communicate with the outside world or with the system level um, in which it is integrated. And we have seen in the last uh, years um, approaches, for example, towards OPC UA to make a standard process interface so that process data from the different processes can be um, given out through this interface and can be used to control the whole production line. We see OPC UA and we see also UMATI as such um, inter interfaces which allow a good and efficient data exchange. And this is the basis of this modular system. Each of these boxes basically behaves like a USB stick. If you plug your USB stick in a computer, then the computer knows immediately how to cope with this USB stick. And so our production modules need to do the same. They describe themselves, they have a clear interface, and if they are um, plugging in the overall production system, they are recognized and uh, in a very short period of time are integrated in the system. And this also leads uh, to intelligent control systems. Um, especially if it comes now to the new technologies like battery production, fuel cell production, and also these hairpin motor production. There are a lot of process parameters uh, still needed to be um, investigated and also to be monitored in order to flexibly react if some uh, deviations occur. And therefore, we see, especially for this I call it unmature production technologies because they are very fresh and very new. Um, so we need, for example, AI, artificial intelligence, to analyze these data to see that something could go wrong in the future and to react immediately and do some corrective actions. So that is very important. So we also need intelligent control systems for these agile production systems. And if you take that all together, then I believe electric mobility will go the same way as the combustion engines went. At the beginning, everybody had a dream. Um, it should be uh, the uh, Model T and everything is fine, which is black and has always the same uh, constitution. And this is uh, at the moment the case also for battery cells. But the future 
and I'm sure will go the same way and we will see more and more variants of battery cells, more and more different formats, different materials, uh, and that will lead us to the thinking whether a transfer line, which is the gigafactory of today, is the concept for the future. And uh, what we see on this slide here is the approach to make an agile production system for battery cells. You see in the first uh, process on the left-hand side, the electrode coating. So this is four redundant modules. Then we have the assembly, the joining, and the cell testing. And as we have in each of these modules, um, kinematics, robotics, which are programmable, we are in a very good uh, position to change from one type of battery cells to another in a very short period of time. And if the volume of the different uh, types are changing, then by adding in each of the process steps additional boxes, you can cope easily with that. We are building up such a system at KIT with the help of uh, BMBF, our federal uh, ministry. But what I want to say is that if you look at the, at the Boston uh, matrix on the left-hand side, um, we need to find another concept to get us in a leading position in uh, battery production. And that could be that we are the first players who adapt um, the concept of agile production to the batteries and also to the electric motors. Uh, we will see that this uh, high number of variants will come. And we should be, as, as the German machine builders, the, the, the first who are able to cope with these volatile markets and with these unsecure volumes we need to produce. And this is, for me, the upper right corner in the, in the matrix, uh, the, the concept of diversification. This might be a niche today, but perhaps in some years from now, we have a lot of different niches, different battery types, battery cells, and then we need production equipment, which is not only possible to produce one type in a certain volume economically, but a system which can be adapted quickly to these needs. And the same is valid uh, for electric uh, motors. Also here, um, we see uh, a lot of different motor concepts and motor designs coming up. And if for each design you would build your own line, then it will be very difficult to be economical. But if you can make your line that agile and flexible that you can also put over the same line different designs of these uh, motors, then once of a sudden your line is always good, uh, well loaded and you make uh, money and the production costs go respectively down. So that is what we believe should also be the concept in our country where we don't have the big volumes like in China. We are more the, the small uh, volume producers but we can cope with complexity and that is our strength and we should transfer these strengths also to the production systems for electric mobility. And I would like to conclude my uh, speech with a vision. We call it the Wertstrom kinematic. So we believe, and you see the Lego uh, plate uh, basic, uh, basic, basically in the middle, we believe that each value stream you basically can build up out of programmable kinematics which you place on a well-defined uh, ground plate. These kinematics can cooperate, can work together. They can adapt and pick up different tools. They can do machining. They can do assembly. They can do the quality inspection and they also can um, transfer material from one place to the other. 
And this should be, to my opinion, at least the future of production. Agile, quickly reconfigurable, and what is shown here on the bottom of this picture, what you need is for sure a real-time IoT platform, which allows you to simulate the whole system before you build it up. Uh, you can calculate the tech times, you can um, derive the movement of the different uh, kinematics out of the analysis of your product, which you have on the CAD system. So the message here is uh, what we can do with Industry 4.0 on the computer. This now needs to be transferred also to the physical layer in the factories. This flexibility we have is the data and the handling of data. This we need to get down to the shop floor. And uh, such programmable kinematics and this approach with a Lego plate and uh, configurable and reconfigurable uh, modules, this could be a good step to make a differentiation in um, our production world. Thank you very much for your attention. So, thank you very much, Professor Fleischer, for uh, your presentation. Um, we have uh, uh, a little bit of time left, uh, which I uh, love to use uh, for, for uh, uh, one or two questions we can uh, discuss. Um, talking about yeah, agile production concepts and yeah, some of our viewers, of course, uh, are uh, uh, representatives from, from smaller, medium-sized uh, uh, companies. W what is your advice uh, to, to these companies uh, just uh, to, to, to get fit for, for the, the, for the, the modu future? The, mo the modular system is, is an idea which allows also small companies to be part of the game as long as they use the defined interfaces like OPC UA, mm -hmm. like Umati. <coughs> and uh, so everybody can bring his speciality as long as, as it's packaged in a Lego brick, uh -huh. which can be combined with other Lego bricks. Uh -huh. And this is the strength of uh, our small companies here in Bad Württemberg. Everybody is a specialist, but this interface concept, this gives the possibility that a lot of small specialists once of a sudden can make a complete system. And the, to make a complete system is not only then uh, reserved for big companies. Also smaller companies, mm -hmm. as long as the interfaces are clear, can work together, can form a consortium and can make a turnkey system, production system. I mean, you're, you're part with the institute, you're part of uh, in a lot of research projects concerning, as you, as you explained, uh, concerning uh, batteries, concerning electric motors. Um, uh, and of course, you, you're offering a lot of possibilities to, to qualify uh, uh, the, the, the people working in, in small and medium-sized companies. Maybe we can use the time uh, 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 yeah. just to, uh, um, uh, that you can explain uh, some of these possibilities so, that you offer. So we, we, we have in Baden-Württemberg a so-called transformation hub for electromobility, and we can uh, invite um, traditional machinery builders to review together the strengths of the company to check how these strengths can be transformed also to the new world of electric mobility and what a company can already do very good combine it with some additional knowledge you have to acquire and once of a sudden you define also first steps in the new world this is an offer we can make um, normally, we do uh, workshops in the companies, uh, sitting with the management, reviewing basically the strengths, the core strengths of a company, and then checking how this can be used to go also in new uh, endeavors like uh, fuel cells or batteries. And so this is open for, for all kinds of companies. They for uh, sure, just uh, at least we would you. like to have uh, first contact with you. Then we do a quick analysis. What could be the idea? And then uh, in, in workshops, uh, we 
develop together the concept. And uh, I believe we have a lot of possibilities. We just need to be, as our minister president said, uh, in order to uh, secure our future, we need to be able to change and to adapt. Mm -hmm. And this is the concept of agile production. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Jürgen Fleischer, uh, for just your presentation, your thoughts, uh, and um, yeah, uh, of course, in general, being such a valuable part of our cluster electric mobility southwest and of our Mobile BW network. So uh, thank you very much for coming here. It was thank a you, pleasure Fischer. meeting you in person. Uh, we met a lot digitally uh, the last year, but uh, seeing you in person. So uh, have a safe trip uh, back to Karlsruhe. Um, and yeah, see you next time. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Herr Fischer. So, uh, then uh, we just uh, um, uh, come to our next uh, presentation. Um, Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Fleischer, again. Uh, and I think before coming to the next presentation, we have a short uh, clip uh, so that everybody can see what uh, Amobile BW is uh, working on. So after this uh, short impression about uh, the activities of uh, Baden-Württemberg uh, on uh, the way to future emission-free uh, mobility, we come now to the uh, next uh, presentation slot. 
Um, yeah, the session is called here new added value through key components. One of these uh, key components on the way to electric mobility, of course, is uh, the electric motor. We already heard from Professor Fleischer that it's very uh, uh, important uh, to produce them uh, um, uh, agile and uh, one of the actors uh, really producing uh, electric motors in Baden-Württemberg is uh, the company Scheffler Automotive in Bühl uh, and the presentation, he is not here in person, uh, he uh, comes to us in the digital space, uh, Thomas Pfund, he is president of the e-motors and PEU business unit uh, at Scheffler uh, Automotive in Bühl near Karlsruhe and the title of his presentation is Motors for Future Powertrains Key Components or commodity. Welcome to my presentation. Today I want to discuss the question if e-motors for future powertrains are key components uh, or rather commodity products. If you discuss mobility today, it always starts with the environmental impact. So climate change is the most relevant technology driver. And for CO2, legislation is already in place. We are discussing Euro 7 for emission regulations. What is not that much in the open discussion yet is the CO2 neutral production. Um, that's why Scheffler did a self-commitment to achieve CO2 neutral production by 2030. Looking a little bit deeper into this um, CO2 targets, we see that the targets are in place around the globe, which is good news. Uh, the most challenging targets are in Europe because we are considering in Euro Europe all greenhouse gas, uh, gases, not only CO2. Um, and look on the lower left side of this chart, we see the fleet target value uh, for 2021 with 114 gram per kilometer. So this is the CO2 legislation. You might ask, why not 95? Uh, because 95 is the value belonging to the NETC cycle. Uh, we have changed this one to WLTC and we transferred uh, this value for this chart here with a factor of 1.2 to this 114 grams. So, but, but it is exactly the European uh, legislation. So this one will change. Um, in the discussion is the, uh, is the amount of change. Um, we think that um, the value will be reduced by 50%. That's why we come to this 57 gram per kilometer in 2030. So this all is considering the so-called tank to wheel model. So only um, fuel out of the tank to the wheels or energy out of the battery to the wheels. So in my opinion, this is not right because um, also in production of fuels, production of energy and uh, production of the cars, recycling and so on, we emit uh, CO2. So that's why we should take this into account if we want to discuss zero uh, CO2 really at 2050. So we think that around 2030 also this model will be changed um, in, in connection with the new target values and maybe uh, on, the, uh, on the way to 2040 uh, we should change to this LCA, so life cycle assessment approach or cradle to grave approach. So coming from this target, um, we investigated uh, what would this mean for the technologies. So, and we think that we will see a technology mix in 2030 of almost 30-40-30 uh, um, scenario, 30% pure combustion engines still, 40% hybrids, and 30% um, pure electric with a um, strong growing share of the pure electrics toward uh, 2035. So this is the view for the world market. If we look into Europe um, and take this minus 50% into account, then we think that we would need in 2030 a share of 61% of pure electric plus 
plug-in hybrids. Where does this come from? Um, I want to show this in this scale model here. Uh, we see these different colored bars. Uh, these bars are showing the technology, so starting with the pure power, uh, pure combustion engine uh, technology in the gray bar, and then the different steps of electrifications, electrification with the impact um, on the consumption up to 100% with, with XEVs. Um, the supporting point of this scale is exactly the target value of 114 gram, and the position of these bars is uh, the CO2 value of this technology. So in the height of this bar simply shows the volume, so the number of the car, cars in this uh, technology, and the car manufacturer now has the target to balance this scale. So because if it would turn left, this would be bad because the car manufacturer would have to pay penalties. If it turns right, it would be good. He could trade with the CO2 certificates. So this changes towards 2030. And uh, we see that um, with this change, we need a increasing uh, share of plug-in hybrids and XEVs to keep this scale in balance. So you might ask, why not XEV only uh, and, and no plug-in hybrids? So this is because there are some boundary conditions. And boundary conditions are availability of renewable energy. Uh, it is also the, the grid to distribute this energy. And it is a question of energy storage to leverage this. So and this can be seen in this chart um, here. Um, this chart shows the renewable energy share in Germany in 2020. Um, and we can see that it is a significant uh, a share already, which is good news. Uh, but we also can see uh, that this um, energy supply is very volatile. So it depends on the weather. Uh, and that's why we would need um, storage technology and capacity to leverage this. Um, the EIA <coughs> did a study on this, and they found out that if you want to leverage this in a, in a world view, um, that we would need at least 10,000 gigawatt hours of storage capacity. And this equals 50 times uh, bigger, bigger size of the, of the current market. So a, a, a huge challenge. And this co co cannot be done with, with additional stationary batteries only. We will need um, um, additional and parallel uh, energy bases. So if we imagine we have this renewable energy on the left-hand side, then we could take this energy and put it directly in the battery of a car and drive with this. This is the shortest pace, uh, the best one in, in efficiency too. So what we uh, talked about storage, if we have to store, we could do this in stationary batteries, uh, redox flow, whatever technology. Uh, and then we, we could take the energy out of, this, uh, out of this storage device and put this into the car. This reduces the overall efficiency, of course. Um, and we have to consider that not all storage can be done by, by additional batteries. So we, we need other technologies. And the um, next uh, technology could be the, the hydrogen. So we use the renewables to produce hydro hydrogen. Uh, fill this into a fuel cell and, and drive with this. Or we could use this hydrogen, um, taking um, also CO2 and produce synfuels. Synfuels could be gas, could be liquid. And um, the, the good, good one on, on this solution is that uh, we could use the available infrastructure. So all the gas stations, stations which are um, out there available could be used. And uh, if we then use this uh, PF technology as well, we could even um, have a uh, okay efficiency. So this um, energy paces and di different uh, technology we will need in the future. 
So looking into te technology to um, influence by, by this different pace, so we see we will see um, hybrid powertrains and EV powertrains in parallel. Um, in the hybrid portion, uh, main technologies are hybrid modules um, and, and DHTs. Hybrid module, I will explain in the next uh, slide. This um, <coughs> DHTs means dedicated hybrid transmission. These are transmissions designed um, yeah, dedicated for this hybrid usage with two uh, energy sources or power sources, the combustion engine and the electric motor. So, and in the portion of the EVs, the dominating technology will be uh, e-axles, but uh, <clears throat> there we will also see different power demands, different car sizes, so we think we will have powers between 50 and 500 uh, kilowatt or even more if it comes to the heavy duty trucks. Um, and we have different use cases, the main drive of, or all-wheel drive, so this um, e-axle technology also has, has to be adapted to the application at the end. So taking out these uh, three main technologies, um, hybrid module is a system which sits in between the combustion engine and the transmission. So the e-motor is connected to the crankshaft of the combustion engine. That means speed range is, is the same. And um, the e-motor can drive through the transmission. So the e-motor load points are supported by the transmission for recuperation and electric driving, which is on one hand side a good news because we can adapt the load point of the e-motor, choosing the best one. Um, on, the, on the other side, on the downside, we always have to deal with the efficiency of the transmission. So DHTs, um, multi-mode is the answer um, of, of Scheffler um, to this technology. Uh, there are different solutions out there with one electric motor, with two electric motors. We have chosen a, um, a system with two electric motors which is um, shortly, shortly explained. So the motor one um, is directly connected to the crankshaft and the motor two is connected to the differential gear, so to the wheels. If we switch off the combustion engine, <clears throat> then we can run the, the, the vehicle completely electrically with the e-motor two. So this feels like an electric car. If battery runs low, then you can start the combustion engine and run the uh, e-motor one as a generator. This is the second mode, so this is like a, a range extender or serial hybrid mode. And the third mode is closing the clutch between these two electric motors. And then the combustion engine is coupled directly through to the wheels. Um, and we can drive at high speeds on, on, on the motorway or autobahn uh, with, with best efficiency. And the combination of these three modes gives us a very good overall cycle efficiency. So last but not least in this row, the e-axles for hybridization uh, also possible, but uh, also the, the main um, uh, drive for pure electric vehicles. Um, <clears throat> we have um, today, um, integrated systems, we call it three-in-one, uh, motor, transmission, and power electronics in, in one package. And the motor is connected to the wheels via a one-gear or two-gear uh, transmission, depending on the application. So, and what I did is, uh, in the next uh, slide, showing the power demands, the torque and speed demands, and the area of best efficiency. What you can see in this chart here is, is the load points, which are driven uh, in the different uh, driving cycles. And the yellow and red color shows the highest shares um, of, of these load points. So, and you can see that this is completely different depending on the application. In, in case of the P2 hybrid, uh, the most driven uh, load points are at lower speeds, are also at, at, at lower torques um, because the, the transmission uh, helps. 
and we have a, a yellow area there in the minus uh, torque range. This is the recuperation um, uh, and, and generator mode. Um, in, in the middle um, of this chart here, the multi-mode DHT, we see E-motor 1. I explained this already, that this motor is, is running as a generator. You can see this red area there. This is exactly the, the generator mode. And uh, the E-motor 2 is running as the drive motor, so the, the load points are completely different. And that's why we also have to adjust and design the motors different uh, to, to, to put the area of best efficiency to, to other load points. And e is also a drive motor. Uh, you can see this is similar to this E-motor 2 of the DHT. So this is power requirements and the area of best efficiency. There are also in parallel uh, constraints coming from the, from the package, from the design space. So um, if you look at a hybrid module, you can see this is um, sitting between combustion engine and, and transmission. There is not much axial space. That's why it has to be short. And we want to integrate into the rotor of this motor, additional port like, like clutches. Uh, that's why the motors are bigger diameter and very short axial lengths. And if we compare this with a motor for e-axle, you, you can easily see that this looks completely different. And um, this has already influenced then on the production technology we want to use. So for these very short motors, uh, we are still using so-called concentrated windings due to the small winding heads we get. And um, for the other solutions, uh, we, are, we are using distributed winding with a special technology that we are developing in Scheffler as well. So, and <clears throat> this is also a very important fact uh, that you influence the behavior of the motor directly by the production technologies. So winding technology influences the copper fill factor, for instance, and therefore the efficiency. The stamping uh, influences with the punching edges the behavior of the steel. So also the loss behavior is also efficiency. So we really have to develop not only the, the product, the motor, but also the production technologies we use. So how can we cope with these different um, requirements? Um, in the development view, developing a new motor is always a balancing task of competing goals. So we have to be good in meeting performance targets, in meeting efficiency targets. We also have to consider the the excitation uh, the motor brings, that means this is the acoustic behavior, uh, material costs is, is important, and so on. So, and the problem is that this, uh, these targets are really competing. So if I improve the acoustic behavior, it usually has have a negative impact on efficiency and peak performance. So that's why uh, we always have, have to take into account what is the installation, what is the application, what is the target of the system. So we need system knowledge to do a good optimization of the motor properties. The other one is to use the methods. So there are a lot of uh, design parameters we can change and this gives us a huge number of combinations. It's millions. And this is uh, what we do then. We have um, optimizers running, um, calculating all these this, uh, different combinations and find out at the end what the best fit is to the requirement set. And this is based on, on tools for, for single task, like the FEA analysis for the magnetics, for the mechanics, for the um, thermal behavior, then the dynamic behavior, eigenform analysis, multi-body simulation, down to simulation of our production technologies and uh, factory simulation. So we try to virtualize this, or we, we already have uh, virtualized this, this whole tool chain 
and um, with these tools and tool chains, uh, we have excellent specialists um, to use it and to find the optimal solution for the application. And this has to be done for every single application. So I cannot take one motor out of one application and put it in the other. I can do this, but the result will not be the best. So for production, this means um, that we have to have a deep vertical integration. I already explained the influence of the uh, technologies to the properties of the product. Uh, that's why we are developing in, in, in parallel the, the uh, production uh, technologies in parallel to the product. Um, and we also have to cope with the fact that the investments are high, that we have to have a very high utilization to achieve good production cost. Um, and this is why we, we install this all um, inside our plants to have this in our hands. Second one is how we combine the technologies, so the process flow. Um, for high volume production, it's well known to use these high volume transfer lines where the product is running from station to station. Um, this is good for low cycle times, um, but it is not very good if it comes to sudden changes from one um, product to the other. And since we see due to these uh, different technologies for hybrids and pure electrics, and, um, and the fact that the single project is also volatile in terms of volumes, uh, we think we have to be very flexible in the future. Uh, and that's why we need, at least in parallel, uh, new approaches for production concepts um, to not directly link the machines to each other, to be flexible in terms of technology uh, of the product and also in volume. Um, to achieve this, uh, it's also well known that the um, requirements to logistics, how the parts flow, is very high. That's why we really need uh, new technologies. We new, need approaches um, like digital twins, um, Industry 4.0. This is necessary to introduce um, such kind of, of line concepts. And last but not least, uh, we have to cope with the challenges um, coming out of, of the environmental impact. Uh, I mentioned this already, so all new plants we build or refunitor uh, uh, old plants for, for these new tasks, uh, we have in mind to, to make these plants CO2 uh, neutral. So in coming from this approach is using these newest technologies and developing this, um, we are able to produce these motors in first step, of course, around the globe, ex exactly there where our customer sits. But we also are able to produce motors and develop all these processes in Europe, in Germany. And this was uh, our decision from yes, last year that we have the headquarter for e-motors in Germany, that we also have the leading production segment in, in Germany and the process development center. And, and to achieve this in point, in, 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 um, also to achieve the, the necessary costs, we have to combine this with ultra-efficient production approaches with very good local supply networks and so on. But using this, um, um, it becomes possible. Key component or commodity? Yeah, this was the initial question. I want to do a short summary. Um, CO2 legislation has a big impact and this leads uh, to a to technologies we will see in parallel, so plug-ins and pure electric powertrains. Um, we will see different energy pace, coping with the renewable energies, which are very necessary. Um, and the storage of this energy will be a, a challenge. Uh, we will see the hybrids uh, uh, beside the pure electric powertrains. Um, if it comes to the e-motor, then we 
have to have different e-motor solutions for these different powertrain technologies. Um, and we have to connect this to the production technology because the e-motor performance is directly influenced by the quality of production technology. And at the very end, last but not least, e-motor influences directly customer relevant properties. So with this efficiency, it's influence on, on the driving range, it's influence on package performance, on weight, on cost. And a system is at, at the end as good as its components. So I think that there is a, a good chance also for the for the e-motor and a big necessity to be developed further according uh, or, or in connection with the um, with the production and the production uh, technologies. So I think yes, we will see high volume production. This might. Um, count for this commodity, but there will also be a lot of uh, additional development we will see, and this is then rather the side of the key component. So this is the end of my presentation for today. Thank you very much for your attention. So, thank you very much to Thomas Pfund, president of the eMotors and PEU uh, business unit at Scheffler Automotive uh, in uh, Bühl near Karlsruhe. Uh, Thomas Pfund could not be here with us uh, today, so uh, as you saw in uh, uh, the background of his presentation, we visited him uh, in his uh, office and recorded his presentation in advance. And uh, before we go, uh, to the next presentation of uh, this afternoon's session. Uh, again, a short clip about Baden-Württemberg's way to zero emission mobility.
So we are back uh, now the third part of our afternoon session new added value through key components and of course uh, uh, there has to be uh, an expert presentation uh, about the field of uh, storage technology and if you happened uh, to visit our Baden-Württemberg uh, pavilion in the last 10 years there was always a key part the presentation of uh, RDS Tech. Uh, this is a medium-sized uh, family-owned company with its headquarters here in Nürtingen near Stuttgart. Uh, and so uh, um, a warm welcome to Thomas Speidel, uh, CEO from RDS Tech Energy uh, and uh, also the president of the German uh, Energy Storage Association. We are looking forward to uh, your presentation. Nice to see you. Nice to have you here. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, also from my side to my presentation and to the session, Battery Buffered High Power Charging. My name is Thomas Speidel and I'm the CEO of ADS Tech Energy. First, a few words to our company. So we started in ADS Tech already 15 years ago with the development and production of own lithium ion battery systems based on the cell. We made our own BMS, including all the software and also the hardware and electronics. And then uh, beginning of 2010, 11, we started with large scale battery systems up to megawatt hour scales. 2012, we had our first containerized battery system. And then from that direction, we moved also to the charging business because we expect electric vehicles to need a lot of power even in the distributed uh, grid areas, and therefore not at every site we can um, set up a mid-voltage system to provide the amount of energy or power we need. In 2018, um, we developed, or we started to develop a battery-based charging system for uh, OEM from South Germany. And since 2018, also Bosch is a partner of ADS Tech and they have 39% of the shares of ADS Tech Energy. We address three different areas in the business. First, residential, and we call it home and small business. And then second, industrial, and third, infrastructure, which is also EV charging. And even when the grid is not able to support enough uh, power, then we use the battery to store the energy and then push the energy out of the storage into the vehicle when a charging process is needed. Let's come to the core of the presentation to the high power charger, including a battery storage system for boosting the energy. So first of all, let me describe the, the rough and um, the system and let, uh, let give me a system overview. So if we have from the grid only a limited um, grid access and a limited power, then we take the battery as a buffer. And so we load the buffer with the low power and after the battery is full, we can take the battery energy, the stored energy with a higher power rate and put it in the electric vehicle. So we can see here, so we have a boosting process from let's say 50 to 100 kilowatt from the grid up to 320 kilowatt directly um, to charge the vehicle. So high power charging can even be provided at locations equipped with a very low or limited grid access. So no grid extension is necessary, which is almost, or which is often uh, expensive. So as you can see on the right side of the slide, if we slowly charge the, the battery, we can pump the energy we have stored in shortest time directly into the electric vehicle. So the charging process, even uh, at low power sites can, can be reduced enormously to a short time. And this is what we need when we drive our electric car. We don't want to wait a long time to get the car refueled or recharged. Here you see 
um, our system in real. So the maximum DC charging power of up to 320 kilowatt or two times 160 can be provided. And we can distribute the charging power to one or two dispensers. Um, so the internal, buffer, uh, the internal buffer enables to boost the limited power from the grid to reach up to the 320 kilowatt to, the, to charge the vehicle. Um, we have the possibility to directly connect to the 400 volt low, um, low voltage grid so the charge box can be almost installed at, at every site starting from a support of 39 kilowatt up to 110, which is sufficient to install a charge box directly on the, on the low voltage grid. Um, our highly integrated power inverter technology based on latest silicon carbide technology allows to get enormous efficiency, not only due to a high voltage level on the DC link, but also that the battery is directly coupled to this internal uh, DC, DC link backbone. The design is very compact, so if we want to go in, distribu in distributed areas, so there's, in, in many spaces, there is, a not, is not enough space to install um, containers or to install transformer stations. So in this case, we only need very small space to provide a fast charging capability. The dispenser itself has a very small footprint. It's only 400 by 400 millimeters, so the dispenser can be almost installed everywhere. Um, now I have a, a, a closer look to the charge uh, box itself. As I said, we can uh, deliver an output of 320 kilowatt, even at a low power uh, connection to the grid. We have an internal battery capacity of up to 140 kilowatt hours, which is the lithium ion based battery. And we passed all the certifications, not only for the EU standards, but also for the US. The, the battery modules itself, they are small battery modules. They can easily be accessed and also be replaced even in the field. We supply up to two dispensers per um, charge box so they can be separated and the system includes everything. So this small box contains the inverter, the battery, the HVAC, which means the, the thermal management and also the controls of the complete system. In addition to that, the system is also prepared to deliver grid services such as uh, power quality or even uh, grid services and later on also bidirectional charging so the, the content of the battery of the car could be recharged or could be directly um, sent to the grid. We also included the IT technology, which means uh, security firewalls and communication units. So we can connect the, the charge box directly to OCPP standard backbone by fire optics or even uh, copper, copper coupling. Mm, the voltage range is pretty high or is pretty wide, so we can support DC ranges from 150 up to 920 volt, which allows us even to, to support batteries of the future or cars being not available today. Um, the dispenser, let me just say a few words uh, to the dispenser. The dispenser, as I said, is a very, very it has a very, very small footprint, so it can be mounted almost everywhere. And it allows the output of 320 kilowatt. It's a cooled cable. It's a water-cooled cable, which uh, provides up to 500 amps. And we are compatible to, as well, C CCS1 or, uh, for the US and CCS2 for Europe. The... Um, the liquid cooled system is very, very um, flexible because we, we can just deploy the dispenser up to 100 meter from the charge box itself. Very important is the low noise. So we have no noise at all in uh, coming from the dispenser because the dispenser not even has a fan. It's just, it, it's really quiet. So in, in areas, for example, residential environments, these kinds of dispenser, um, provide really no or 
have, have no emissions um, as far as noise is concerned. Um, there's a standard 10, 10 inch touchscreen installed and also an RFID reader so that we can directly um, have access to, to the charging process and as well to the, uh, with the communication to the OCPP backend, as I mentioned already. Here's an overview how the uh, installation could be. We see the space and we see the, the length of the cable. So we can put the, the box up to 200 meters um, away from the grid access point and then between the booster, which is the box, and the dispenser, we have two times 100 meters. So the uh, distance between dispenser and charge box can be up to 100 meter, which allows a very flexible installation in, in many uh, complex um, installation air, um, situations. Now we see how small the complete system really is. We see the box now, it's it's about 1.2 uh, uh, cubic meters. And uh, the box itself, including the complete inverter technology, the battery, the HVAC, everything is about 2.6 tons. And the dispenser is around 180 kilo, as you can see it here on, on the right side, as it's pointed out. So we need only very, very less space, uh, which allows us the system to be installed at every any any um, location, which makes it possible to really fast charge cars in distributed areas where no powerful grid access is available. And not every in every situation we need the high power grid access because we don't need to charge one car after the other, like we do on the charging hubs, for example, at the autobahn or highway. Um, here I want to show you a performance example, how to recharge 80% of your car in a just 20 minutes, even at such a power limited grid access. So we always say that recharging a car should be around 15 to 20 minutes and we can now prove here with this uh, example that this is possible. Here we see three sequential charging sessions without any derating. And between every session we have 10 minutes pause. And we can see it on the diagram on the right side. We get the, the power from the battery is uh, pointed out in blue. And the additional power comes from the grid because we have always we have some grid uh, um, power being available and now you, the the red line points out the sum so it's the total available power from the battery and the grid and we see that this is going up to 280 kilowatt in this case uh, which the car um, in the, in this example requests so we charged here in, the, in this example three times after an, uh, in, in a sequence around 66.4 kilowatt hours, which corresponds, tends, co corresponds to around 80% of the SOC state of charge of the vehicle's battery. So we can recharge in, in only 20 minutes around 80% of um, the SOC of the vehicle battery. This is quite fast. And uh, in this case, you see the energy, which is charged in the car, which is the lower right um, diagram. And we see the energy, uh, the amount goes up. And then in total, it's around 199 kilowatt hours we charged within these three sessions. And per session, it's around 66.4 kilowatt hours. And another a question we, we often uh, ask is how long does it take to recharge the internal battery? And what we can see here, the recharging process with the grid excess of, of around 80 kilowatt is uh, roughly one, one, point, one hour and 15 minutes. And um, uh, since we have installed quite some of these systems in the field, we never run in the, or came in the situation that uh, charge box ran out of battery. So the recharging process of the battery 
with the energy coming from the grid is all, always going in parallel to the uh, processes that the car is changing, that uh, people are waiting, and that it takes uh, some time between two uh, sequential charging sessions. Um, what we see here is now we have set up a, a mass production um, in, in Dresden, in the east of Germany, and we see that now we are, we are able to produce even higher volumes. So between September last year and December, for example, we built more than 300 of these um, charge boxes and more than 600 dispensers. Up to now, it's over 800. Um, here you see also some reference uh, installations and we see that it perfectly fits in different situations we know from our daily life. So it could be industrial park, even at the gas station. So we see here in the middle of the page, we see a gas station which is located in Berlin, Alexanderplatz. And we know from this um, example that even this battery, which is the highest uh, which has the highest frequency of charging processes and uh, never ran out of the battery. And what we can see on the right picture, so the box is just being in the corner, so you can install it in the corner where little space is, is left and then the dispensers with a very little footprint can be <clears throat> placed in almost every corner or in this case in this middle field here between the parking lots. On the left side down here, we see it in a, in a, a country or in an in a area where even a transformer, you see the transformer house in the, in the back of the picture. And so this solution can even make sense if there is a, a mid-voltage transformer in a system, but there is not enough power left to provide, a, for example, 300 kilowatt or two times 160 kilowatt charging infrastructure. Um, the picture in the middle, uh, in the lower side of the, of, the, of the picture of the slide, shows um, uh, industrial site. And we more and more have the experience that people or guests or even uh, employees who, who are driving electric cars, that they don't want to wait for hours. So if they just pass um, or visiting the company for one or two hours, then they are happy that they can recharge the car within 20 minutes or 30 minutes. On the right side, we see a installation on a utility site in, in east of Germany, and so are many sites now, um, not only in Germany, which are equipped with this technology. So let me just show you another application which we call a mobile high power charger and it contains exactly the same technology but in a different setup. Uh, what we see here is a, we call it a charging trailer. The touch, charging trailer is a standard, let's say it's, 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 on a, on a, um, it's on a trailer for a standard truck in Germany or in Europe and this one contains a battery which uh, with more than two megawatt hours of um, energy capacity and 10 charging points, 10 fast chargers. Each of them can provide 320 kilowatts. So on this trailer we can uh, provide, or with this trailer we can provide 3.2 megawatt charging power um, distributed on 10 outlets. And uh, so why do we need this? Uh, the applications are temporary uh, solutions offering high power charging in an infrastructure which is not equipped with a high power charger infrastructure for 100% or 365 days per year. So for example, during holidays, we have a higher amount of uh, charging sessions or driving events. We support a lot of driving events, uh, marketing or press uh, events, or even festivals. So just imagine there are festivals and a lot of people are coming with the electric vehicle and just for a few days you need um, uh, more charging power so you, you are not able to extend the grid but in this case we can use the charging trailer and this is exactly the same technology the same inverter technology the same controls and the same cooling system it's flexible 
in, in setup and installation because it's mobile. Uh, there is uh, individual planning, so we can take it everywhere ev uh, around Europe, and we provide a 24-7 support and on-site service. Um, here on the next page, uh, you see this in live. So we see the side walls can be aut automatically be folded up. So normally on the road it's closed, and then if you have positioned the trailer, you just open the, the, the wings automatically. Um, to recharge the battery in the trailer, we, we need just the 400 volt um, low voltage grid access, so three phases for 50 hertz. And we, we support one to six uh, inlets, each um, taking 125 amps with a standard CEE plug. So the recharge process can, can be done almost everywhere. So the maximum recharging power is 500 kilowatt. And <clears throat> so we can recharge the complete trailer with, uh, within two hours. In addition to that, the trailer supports an island mode so without any grid connection, we can just offer a charging infrastructure like a power bank on wheels um, in, in this island mode and then uh, provide up to 10 charging sessions in parallel. Five EVs per side and 10 in total, each up to 320 kilowatt charging in parallel. Uh, also the cables, uh, the same as in the charge box, is, uh, is liquid cooled and um, has a CCS2 plug. So the dimensions of the trailer are standard, as you know it from the um, common standard of the trucks in Germany or Europe. And even the weight, we do not, um, or we are within the weight specifications of the standard truck specification in, in Europe. Here are some examples uh, where the trailer has already been used and we see uh, the, the Porsche event. So we supported the Taycan um, launch in, in Barcelona. And for example, for this event, there have been seven trucks in parallel providing 21 megawatt charging power um, at the same time. So 70 cars can charge in parallel and each car up to 320 kilowatts. So to enable such a charging performance or power on a, on a site, normally you have to build up quite a significant um, grid and, and power. What we also have, or what we see on the pictures, we have some experience even in cold uh, countries. So we did the, the winter experience in Finland so even um, on cold te with cold temperatures, the, the trailer is working and can supply the energy for the charging process. And what we all will see is as more and more electric vehicles will come into the field, into our daily lives, and this will happen the next year. So when we see the big OEMs now bringing more and more vehicles to the market, so the demand of charging and especially fast charging will grow. This is for sure because we don't want to wait for uh, longer as it uh, really needs to to get back on our on the road or to come home earlier and we driving does not mean waiting and this is important so we expect more and more supercharger not only at the autobahn or at um, high power grid stations so we also expect it in distributed areas or in this case even with the mobile solution, which is mounted on a truck and can be provided to any location where it's needed or temporarily needed. Thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions open from you, Mr. Fischer, for example, then I'm, I'm happy to answer. So 
first of all, thank you very much uh, for being with us uh, uh, today. Uh, to be honest, I especially liked your example uh, of uh, a mobile solution needed for a festival, people gathering for uh, some purpose. Uh, um, yeah, at the moment, uh, hard to imagine, but uh, we all hope that it will be uh, uh, be possible soon. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think um, you pointed out uh, um, a lot of people always say, uh, as you pointed out, uh, it's not only about high power charging on on the on the motorways uh, but but you showed a, a lot of different uh, uh, use cases uh, uh, for that so I think it's it's becoming uh, uh, much more important uh, um, uh, uh, in in the future uh, and it's a growing market of course we will have a study out soon okay uh, um, about the uh, yeah the market development uh, of of charging infrastructure. Yeah, we even see cities. Um, so if they pr have a pizzeria or a museum or whatever, and people are just passing by to get a pizza, or to go to the museum or to a concert, then right. after one or two hours they want to leave. And so in this case, if you come from outside. You, you have to recharge within minutes and uh, nobody wants to drive to the autobahn and lose yeah. one and a half hours just to get there and to charge and yeah. get back. So okay. our Thanks time is up. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas Speidel, for thank being you. with us. Uh, and hopefully next year uh, we uh, live, yeah. talk live in Hannover, yeah. uh, maybe having a coffee together. Uh, so uh, yeah, good. thank you much uh, for being here. Uh, so. This was the third part of our afternoon session. Um, and uh, now we have a short break again. Uh, and then we have the last presentation in this afternoon session. So thank you very much. Thank you.
So, uh, hello again. Uh, we are back to the fourth part uh, of our afternoon uh, session, new added value through key components. And as we saw in the clip uh, today, now it's time for fuel cell on. Uh, and for this, we have an excellent expert here. Uh, we say uh, a warm welcome to Professor Dr. Markus Hölzle. He is member of the board and head of the Electrochemical Energy Technologies Division uh, at the Center for Solar Energy and Fuel Cell uh, Research here, uh, here in Baden-Württemberg, short form ZSV. So, uh, Professor Hölzle, it's uh, so good to have you here. The stage is yours. We are looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for a great introduction. It's a pleasure being here and basically to terminate the day today with a lecture on fuel cells. And as you can see, I am a member of the board of the ZSW and I'm responsible for the activities within the ZSW for batteries and fuel cells. And we come to some details later in the presentation. The talk is about HiFab. It's a new endeavor that we are running together with partners really to accompany the basically the launch of fuel cells in the mass market. And you will see what we are planning to do and also what we are planning not to do because that is as important as what we really want to do there. But before going in, let me introduce the ZSW because it may not be known to all of you. The ZSW is an institute with roughly 300 employees among that 250 scientists in an annual turnover of 50 million euros, what is quite a high number because we are really running big size equipment. And the specialty of our institute is that we are really cooperating very close to industry. Our base load funding from the state of Baden-Württemberg is rather low, and therefore we have to bring in a lot of money, both from R&D project, but especially from industry. Our focus is on batteries and supercapacitors, hydrogen and fuel cells, and photovoltaics, on renewable energy fuels, and also on energy politics and economics, as well as our newest baby on wind energy. If you see all the long list, you may put this together in a way that we really take care for the primary energy generation as well as primary energy conversion and storage. These all are very hot topics today and they are topics that are changing the way we are living. And therefore I think it's good that ZSW is taking care for these topics for already 30 years in a row. And therefore we have a great experience dealing and delivering great results. I mentioned already that we are dealing with many, many companies, professional companies in the field of batteries and fuel cells. A short list is shown here, and you may be among these companies, and the list is ever growing because this is the DNA of ZSW in difference to other institutes and universities that our home turf is really to play with industry because the mission of ZSW is to bring technology from university level into the market, and this is what we are doing on a daily basis. The ZSW, as I mentioned, is an institute founded by the state of Baden-Württemberg. Therefore, by definition, our sites are within Baden-Württemberg. Our headquarters is in Stuttgart, that you can see on the upper left-hand side. It holds our research on photovoltaics, energy politics, energy carriers, and our central divisions. We have a test platform for solar panels on the Schwäbische Alb, and we have two locations in Ulm. Ulm is at the border to Bavaria in the southeast of Baden-Württemberg, where we are running on the upper end. You see our, basically our initial building, the building we had been grown, the ZSW, dealing today with hydrogen and fuel cells. And on the right-hand side at the bottom, you see the so-called e-lab, where we are running our battery activities. Ulm is a rather small city, maybe 120,000 population, the bigger area, 200,000. So you may consider Ulm as too, being too small for the topics we are dealing with, but that's not true because Ulm is really one of the global centers of electrochemistry. Within the Ulm Science Park, we have four institutes dealing with electrochemistry. That's the University of Ulm, where is the fundamental electrochemistry. That is the Helmholtz Institute with a big focus on battery development and battery components design. We have the ZSW being responsible for technology development, prototyping, and transfer into the market. And we have the THU there, more dealing with the electro part of the fuel cells of batteries of energy conversion and storage. 
This altogether is roughly 400 plus scientists dealing with electrochemical topics. And there are not so many centers of electrochemistry on a global basis compared to what we have available in, in Ulm, basically within a 10 minute walking distance. The CENSW, to come back to that, has three divisions. Basically, on the left hand side, my colleague Friedrich Steis is heading the division for politics, for studies, for wind energy, but also for electrolysis, that means for hydrogen generation, for CO2 adsorption, for e fuels. Michael Povala, who is managing our activities in photovoltaics, mainly dealing with thin layer photovoltaics, today also with perovskite structures and other developments. And on the right hand side, it's my responsibility in Ulm for batteries hydrogen and fuel cells. In Ulm, we have roughly 180 scientists working on these two topics, so it's a rather big chunk of the ZSW. And again, you will see why we need so, so many people there, because we have a widespread development, both in batteries and fuel cells. What are we doing in fuel cells? Basically, we are doing everything from cradle to grave, but of course, we have some certain focus areas because the system is so complex that nobody can really cover all the fuel cells in the whole wide span area. We are working on materials, for instance, electrocatalysts. We are not doing membrane development. We are typically buying membranes, but we're doing MEA. We're typically buying GDL. We have some development there. We are doing balance of plant components, but we're doing a lot in the stack design and stack construction, stack building, including a lot of modeling, design, and prototyping, as you will see later on. And with our newest baby, the HiFab, we also will move into the stack production that is lagging at the moment. We do battery production on a pilot scale, but we don't do stack production for fuel cells right now. We have a strong focus on evaluation. I think we are operating the largest independent fuel cell test field in Europe. We have roughly today 45 test benches where we are dealing with own developments, but also serving customers' needs and testing fuel cells from all the major players around in Germany. And we do a lot of analytics that you always need for the fresh products, intermediates, but also post-mortem. And we have a bunch of data, and a bunch means quite a lot of data from over 30 years of measuring fuel cells that we are now using together with machine learning routines for a kind of predictive lifetime and predictive maintenance development for fuel cells. We also have, and that's very important, in parallel, a lot of hydrogen activities. You only can operate fuel cells if you understand hydrogen. We have a lab that is called HiLab. It's also a trademark of BSF. It's one of the three leading hydrogen quality labs in the world. We just passed a global round robin test as number one, two, or three. It wasn't basically disclosed at the end, but we had been among the top three out of 15 labs globally. And we also have a mobile test device for certifying hydrogen refueling station. It's basically a trailer that you see in the bottom center picture where we are trailing around whole Europe and we're basically evaluating and checking the quality and the refueling standards of refueling stations. We also have a 700 bar refueling station on site where we can first and really monitor what's going on. And as it gives you an idea that we are not just focusing on fuel cells, but also taking into account the whole hydrogen infrastructure. So let's now come to the HiFab project. The HiFab project is a joint endeavor of Fraunhofer ISE in Freiburg, of ZSW in Ulm, and the VDMA, what is a kind of association of the German mechanical engineers. And we all three together want to really accelerate the market launch of fuel cells. And you see the whole picture starts basically in dark winter and it gives you some indication on a groundbreaking ceremony. This was indeed happening in Ulm in February this year. And it is, you will see later on what happened really and what was happening in the meantime. But now let's focus on what is HiFab. HiFab should support the German industry in growing the fuel cell from something that is manufacture, that is handmade into a mass product. We have a clear focus on the PEM fuel cell. We are not looking into other type of fuel cells. And we're looking mainly into the components, into the assembly, into end of line testing and the commissioning. We want to create and evaluate quality procedures and testing protocols as, as also standards. Most important, we want to generate an industry know-how. In Germany, we call it Branchenwissen. This is existing in the meantime for batteries but it's not so much known what are the key criteria for fuel cells. What are people talking if they talk fuel cells? These are things we want to create and generate. 
It should be an entry platform for newcomers, especially for small and mid-sized enterprises who want to check if this could be a market and an industry they want to go in and what is really needed and necessary. We want to link and create new supply chains with new players. And we want to educate and train specialty specialists, but also the general public. So that's the idea of the HiFab project. And it's a project that will also serve the industry with something we call generic stack. And I will show later on what is in behind that one. So basically, we want to give hardware to the industry and hardware to people and associations interested going into fuel cells that they will really see what we have and where to go. It's very important we are not reinventing the wheel here. So we take what is available. We are not going into new catalysts. We are not going into new prey, into new membranes. We will take the graphite-based bipolar blades and the metal-based bipolar blades. That's all available. And this all will make the way into the market. There's no need for reinvention, for new invention. That's very important. But there's a need to get these things and the tasks now done really quickly. And this is where basically the HiFab should support the industry. HiFab has received a lot of money from local and German governments. And I would like to thank the people who really organized that one, the ministries here in Baden-Württemberg of economy and of traffic and, and house building, and also in Germany, the, the federal ministry of traffic. Altogether, there had been roughly 18.5 million euros flowing so far into this project, mainly for construction of new building and infrastructure. I showed to this later on, but also to our colleagues from East and Freiburg and to us to really start scientific and development projects to get things running. We are now looking into a future of 10 years and an additional funding of roughly 30 million euros coming from Federal Ministry of Transportation. And we are happy to receive so much money. On the other hand, we also recognize if you want to do reliable research and development at the interface between university and industry, you need a certain size of machinery, you need certain expensive equipment. You just have a need for such amount of money. But again, thank you very much for all the ministries supporting this endeavor. Why do we do this here in Baden-Württemberg? Because it's pretty clear Baden-Württemberg is the center of fuel cell development in Germany. And therefore, it takes a unique position in Germany. And that's maybe the role Baden-Württemberg will have to play in the next years if it comes to hydrogen development, hydrogen infrastructure, and hydrogen technology. We don't have all the wind turbines of the northern part of Germany. Therefore, many topics related to generation of hydrogen and storage of hydrogen will be explored in the northern part of Germany. Center part, North, North Rhine-Westphalia, taking play, care for use of hydrogen in steel industry, for instance, in chemical industry. But Baden-Württemberg is the heart of fuel cell development with basically all main German players being a kind of along the highway A8 going from Mannheim here to Ulm. Companies like Audi, Cellcentric, Daimler Volvo Joint Venture, Freudenberg, Ecpo, Ellering Klinger, Plastic Onium Joint Venture, Iveco Magiros in Ulm for trucks, Robert Bosch for Fuser Systems. And if you extend a little bit to Bavaria, you end into Proton Motors, into Smart Fuel Cells, into BMW, and again into Freudenberg. So that's all what you have in Germany, and this is all here. And you see Fraunhofer uh, East in Freiburg and the ZSW in Ulm are nicely located in that center of gravity for fuel cells. And therefore, it makes a lot of sense to investigate here. Also, there is a lot of industry, tier two, tier three, tier four, right now supplying the car industry here with Porsche, with Mercedes, with Audi, but also with Bosch and the other suppliers, with parts and components. And these players also will have to transition into new applications and this could be the fuel cells. And therefore, it's the right place to be here that was identified. And therefore, we have everybody close around in a driving range of maybe one hour. And this is also very good to accelerate developments. The whole value chain that we are covering is basically starting from a membrane and catalyst. These are two components we are buying in. Then our colleagues in Freiburg from Fraunhof Easy, you'll see it here in dark green, will take care for the CCM assembly and for the MEA assembly. And the MEA is then handed over to us in Ulm, and we will then basically build the stack, the fuel cell stack, out of the MEA and bipolar plates with balance of plant components. We will go into end of line quality check, and we will go into conditioning and commissioning of these stacks. So this is the kind of the burden sharing and work sharing that we have. 
And I think it's pretty nice because the core competency of Fraunhofer is uh, for many, many years is on the MEA development, whereas in Ulm it's more on the stack development. You see a little bit the task that we have here, basically looking into the manufacturing processes and the process stability. What environment do we need? Do we need dry room? Do we need clean room? What level of clean room do we need? What is the quality check we have to do? End of line factory acceptance test. How much time do we have to do it? Right now it's a multi-hour testing, eight to 10 hours. This has to come down to below one hour. These are all topics we are looking in. So there's a lot of work you can see here that will keep us busy over the next years. And again, all this will happen together with industry partners. The machinery that we will use will come from industry partners. It's not homemade, it's not self-invented. It's machinery that is used in the market and that we will take in our labs also to investigate the processes and basically to do that kind of work where the industry just doesn't have the time to take care for it because industry is now in a rush to really bring this fuel cell from a handmade system into a mass production system. And there's so much work that has to run in parallel and we would take care for part of this work in the HiFab project. Let's now focus on what's going on in the HiFab in Ulm. I mentioned already the groundbreaking in February, maybe the coldest day with a snowstorm that we had this year. However, what we see here is what we will get out of the groundbreaking within the next 12 months. It's basically a gas farm on the right hand side to store all the necessary gases, especially hydrogen, of course. A big hall for testing of fuel cells and a central building for offices and for basically all the technical systems that you need to provide all the electricity and gases and whatever and safety requirements for doing all the fuel cell testing. This building can hold at the end of the day roughly 70 test benches for fuel cells and it's a picture from last week where you see the construction as it is right now. So the front part is the construction that is going on. It's still on the ground level, but now with this pre-manufactured pieces, we will see a big progress over the next weeks and months. You can follow on the ZSW homepage, our live webcam to see what's going on. In behind are the buildings of the ZSW as they are today. The whole building complex after being finished in 18 months will look like that. We had been seeing the gas storage already, just to give you an idea, up to 2.5 million norm cubic meters of hydrogen can be managed then per year. We have the testing hall there with two stories. We have the central building with the offices. And then on the left hand side, we will see another construction starting most likely August, September this year. This is a real high fab assembly hall. That's a building where the machinery will get into really manufacturing the fuel cells. And not shown here, but shown on the next picture is basically a building that is perpendicular on the left hand side to the high fab assembly hall. This is a building where we have a so called annex building. And this is where we will build in a big seminar area where we will do our training. You see it on the ground floor here. We have additional offices and lab on the first and second floor, directly connected to the manufacturing area. And again, directly connected to the testing area. So you see it's an impressive building complex that we will put there within 18 months. And this will allow really to give an environment that we need to really run this project full speed. I mentioned already one very important piece of this development this is a so-called generic stack. And it's an open and modular stack design that ZSW has developed together with the VFF. It allows a stack power up to 150 kilowatt. It allows power densities up to five kilowatt per liter. Sorry, it's missing here, the liter. It's an open source stack that we really can give out of our hands that people can use without being limited by third party patents. The stack is designed both with a metallic as well as a graphitic bipolar plate. And it's a seal on plate concept for the metallic bipolar plate. We have a full simulation of that stack available that we can share with basically our partners. And we have a digital twin under development. However, it's important that we are not focusing on a digital twin that maybe is a difference to many projects that we see today running in the university environment. We would like to have the hardware. We would like to be able to hand over 100 bipolar plates to a company that is, for instance, working right now already in forming metals so that they can see what does it mean having a bipolar plate for fuel cells. We want to discuss with different companies being in the field of sealing technologies because there are so many sealing technologies available. So we need a bipolar plate without a seal to test out different sealing technologies. 
That's all basically done with the hardware of the generic stack. And therefore we think it's very important to have it. The stack is, as I mentioned, fully designed. We had been already sourcing out some development packages to development partners. I can talk about the metallic bipolar blade with the seal on blade that is taken care by ECPO by Elring Klinger. We have access to a graphitic bipolar blade that is not with a seal. So we are dealing with different sealing companies, but it also goes to like of the balance of plant components and the end blade components. So a lot of activity is going on there. And again, important is to have something on hand that we can hand over to interesting companies that have so far never touched a fuel cell and never dealt with a fuel cell in their own development and manufacturing areas. The whole generic stack is based on the extensive expertise in simulation that we have at ZSW. So the flow field is really simulated in any detail from ZSW, knowing what is possible in the industry, but still in the final stage in close cooperation with an industry partner, because only industry can really give us the latest insights of what is possible, how thin can the bipolar plate become, how thin can the film become, what curvature is possible for the channels but everything else is fully modeled and we basically can, over, can hand over the modeling package also to other companies who are interested into entering, the, for instance, the field here of the metallic bipolar plates. So I think that's very important that you know that because it's important that this is an open platform. There's no exclusivity in the HiFab. The HiFab basically can take orders from industry. There will be later on an industrial advisory board that will kind of take the orders, will discuss the orders, and then will release the interest and the orders from industry into the research and development organizations, both at Fraunhof, ESA, and Freiburg, as well as ZSW in Ulm, all together into a joint project. And then we will do with our expertise in basically development, we'll try to solve the problem together with industry. Nothing will happen without the impact and the close cooperation with industry. And again, we think that's the most important thing in the HiFab project, and maybe also one of the most important differentiators to other projects that are now mushrooming everywhere, dealing also with the development of fuel cells. So that also brings me a little bit to the summary, a little bit ahead of time, but it's maybe the right direction. So the HiFab is, a, as I have shown you, a joint project of ZSW, Fraunhofer ISE, and the VDMA, the Association of the Mechanical Engineers in Germany. It should support the ramp up of fuel cell stack production. So we are really focusing on the fuel cell stack because anyway, that's the key component. It's the most expensive one, the most difficult one. We are not looking into balance of plant components. Of course, we need them to run our systems but we have access to them and both Fraunhof ESA as well as ZSW are very experienced in running basically full-fledged test benches for fuel cells. But the focus is really the fuel cell stack and there might be other centers coming up in Germany later on dealing with hydrogen technology starting from generation, storage, fueling and doing the system around but we can really concentrate now on the fuel cell stack. Technology input from industry using today's material and components to develop processes for tomorrow. I stressed this point already twice, but I would like to do it a third time. And I would like a little bit to take analogy to batteries. If you look into lithium ion battery, what is an extremely successful technology today? And if you look back basically in the, into the invention of the batteries and the Nobel Prize is being awarded, then you see the materials and the technology where the model, Nobel Prize was awarded was basically something that Sony brought into the market 30 years ago. And lithium ion battery has not changed much in view of materials being employed for the first 10 years. But what was done very successfully in the first 10 years was already a cost reduction and an increase in energy content. So basically using the materials that had been available at that time, for instance, the LCO cathode material from Good Enough, the industry was able to build a working system and to start getting the cost down also by ramping up basically the volume of batteries being produced. And only in the last 10 years with basically lithium ion batteries moving into automotive applications, then also on the material sides, development had been done, for instance, in changing from cobalt as a key element in the cathode to nickel and manganese right now, and now also on the anode side from graphite to silicon. But it underlines that you cannot do everything at a time, so let's focus on what is really necessary to do, 
And this is the ramp up of a fuel cell from lab and development into mass production using the components that we have. Therefore, also the HiFab project will concentrate on that one. We will focus on the assembly technology. Assembly also starts with the MEA development already in Freiburg, but then especially the assembly of the fuel cell stack, quality checks, manufacturing speed, reduced off-spec rates, and factory design. So sometimes I make the joke, we are building stacks with an error, with a mistake, to learn what is the impact of that later on in the use of the stack. We have the generic stack for industry training and to attract new players. We think we need more player in that market. We need more positive competition and you know in automotive application and this is what where we see the fuel cells at least you need two suppliers even better having three of them therefore more companies have to enter and we want to be the door opener for these companies and by doing that we want to generate the industry know-how we want to train experts we want to train new players and we want to train basically also the publicity and the public around that a fuel cell is something that really you will see in the future in the mass market. And I think that's for today. Thank you very much for your attention. Again, thank you very much for the people giving the money here. We have a high responsibility with the money and we will use it the best way. We are believing in fuel cells and we hope to make it happen. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Dr. Markus Hölzle, uh, for your very interesting uh, presentation uh, and yeah, for the insight in, in the HIFAB Baden-Württemberg. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, thumbed up uh, that uh, you have a lot of participation uh, by the industry, of course. Uh, but uh, yeah, as you, are, as you said, uh, I, I think in, in the last year, especially uh, the fuel cell te technology really gained momentum. Uh, we see it within our cluster network, a cluster fuel cell uh, BW uh, gained a lot, a lot uh, new members uh, in the last year. So mm -hmm. the, the interest is, is very, very large uh, by the companies. So, um, yeah, uh, we appreciate really the, the ZSW being such a valuable part of our network. Uh, so together, I think, um, yeah, we just uh, go on working and, uh, yeah, uh, working on the breakthrough of the fuel cell technology here in Baden-Württemberg. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is it uh, Yeah, from our side uh, for, for today. This was the fourth presentation of our afternoon session. Um, yeah, what's next? Uh, actually, uh, we, uh, this morning we had a session about the software-defined vehicle. We discussed different aspects of software architecture for future car uh, generations. Uh, we were talking about the uh, ongoing business transformation about artificial intelligence. And in the afternoon, the session uh, we just ended uh, was uh, uh, focused on new add value through key components. We were talking about agile production concepts, uh, about electric motors, uh, of uh, about uh, yeah uh, batteries and uh, uh, storage technology. And uh, of course, uh, in our last presentation, uh, Professor Hölzler, uh, explained us uh, uh, yeah, the high fat Baden-Württemberg and uh, yeah, the goal uh, to produce fuel cells here in uh, Baden-Württemberg. Uh, so this was it for today. Um, you, uh, all, to our viewers, uh, you have the possibility to follow the program of our colleagues from Baden-Württemberg International. Uh, it will start uh, at uh, 15.30. And uh, from our side in the Immobile BW stream for this today, for today, we are just at the end of, of our program. We will come back uh, tomorrow at 10 o'clock uh, on this channel uh, with uh, a session uh, concerning automated and connected driving in the morning and in the afternoon we will have our startup session. So I hope you enjoyed uh, our very interesting presentations for today and our uh, uh, program and uh, hope to see you uh, tomorrow and hope to see you soon in person uh, and not in the digital world. So thank you very much um, for today. Goodbye. See you tomorrow. <laughs>